A Fiery Bride for the Reserved Rancher. Written by Etta Foster and published by Starfall Publications. Available on our website in multiple formats. Save more with our bundles. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Savannah Walton gripped the reins and turned Thunder to the left, easing him around the curve. As the galloping black stallion's hooves raced across the hard ground, the wind whipped at her clothes and twisted her blonde tresses into a tangled mess. Savannah's cares were left behind. If only her time in Thunder's saddle would do the same for her problems. Rounding another curve, she pulled on the reins to slow the stallion's pace. As the horse's speed reduced, Savannah's disappointment crept higher. The red barn came into view all too soon, along with the knowledge that her stay in Georgia must come to an end. Sure, she had been born here, but the South could not remain her home. At one time, the mere thought would have brought regret and remorse. Now that she'd proven her ease on horseback and skill at firing a gun, men didn't look her way for a suitable wife. Even the stable boy awaiting Thunder's reins seemed to care less for the rider's dismount than the horse. Give him a good rub down and dinner if you would, Ben, she said, handing over her four-legged friend. Of course, Miss Walton. I'll take good care of him. Thank you. She didn't bother hiding the sadness in her voice. Left with the fading thrill of her ride, Savannah waited outside the red barn. Frank Elliott, the owner of the horse farm, walked toward her and tipped his hat. Hope you enjoyed the ride, Savannah, he said. I did. Thunder is a fine horse, strong yet gentle. He is that. Mr. Elliott nodded shifting his weight from one worn booted foot to the other. And he always looks forward to your coming. I think you're his favorite rider. Savannah smiled, already missing her four-legged friend. She would have to come out before she left Georgia to say goodbye and give him some carrots. Always take good care of him, Mr. Elliot, please. She knew he would, but felt compelled to say it anyway. Of course, Savannah, I love him almost as much as you do. The aging farm owner had seen her and Thunder tearing across the soil more times than she could count. I'm using the buckboard to head into town so I can offer you a ride if you like. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Sensing his impatience reminded her of her father. Although when I get back, father will probably yell at me for being late. Oh, no, Mr. Elliot motioned for her to follow him as he continued. Your father was a pretty good horseman in his day. He shouldn't get angry. You don't know my father as well as you think you do, Savannah thought. When they were beside the buckboard, Mr. Elliot took her hand and helped her into the seat. Proving spry for his age, he quickly climbed up and flogged the reins. The two brown and white geldings trotted down the road, deep in thought, her forehead wrinkled in a frown as the buggy rolled toward town. At first, she had resisted the idea of becoming a mail-order bride. Whispered words here and there and disparaging looks had made her rethink her bleak future. Millersville, a dead town, held no young men willing to take on an independent wife. Frankly, there wasn't a man inside the town limits that she liked anyway. And to be honest, no young man within 20 miles of the town wanted to court her either. Her ability to ride faster and shoot better than most men had crushed her chances. When she returned home, she was going to diligently read the mail order bride's section of matrimonial times, the newspaper devoted to helping women find a match to a potential husband. Her target location, she decided, would be the West, a place of adventure and excitement. Reading dime novels had always given her a sense of wonder and amusement. So why not head to the land beyond the Mississippi? The lurid tales of gunfights and Indians and outlaws 
although they were fiction, fired her fascination. Leaning back in her seat and closing her eyes, she imagined opening them again in Colorado, Oregon, or California. The jarring buggy ride became a thrilling race across new soil, with a powerful horse responding in kind to her every move. And then it all stopped. Savannah, you're home, Elliot said. She shook her adventure from her head and looked at her two-story yellow house with a lantern glowing in the living room. Thank you, Mr. Elliot, poured from her on a heavy sigh. Every step toward the door strengthened her resolve to venture to the west. Before she could even reach for the doorknob, her father yanked the door open and scowled at her. Savannah, you're late, as usual. What do you have to say for yourself? I apologize, father. Her accepting tone quirked one of his unruly eyebrows. Yes, I am late. I was riding thunder, and we were having such good fun that I lost track of time. Please forgive me. I didn't mean to make you and Mama worry. Her father, a large man with a bushy mustache and eyebrows to match, looked as if he had been struck by lightning. His already large black eyes widened. Astonishment replaced his anger as he looked past Savannah, maybe seeking the reason for her contrition somewhere in the dark. Well, we were worried, he blustered a bit, then calmly stated, but I understand. I'm glad you and Thunder had a good time. She walked inside, lighter in step now that she had accepted her fate. Father, the rye gave me time to think. You know that I have been considering my future like becoming a mail-order bride. I've thought long and hard about my resistance to that path. Now I think it's for the best. His shocked moment of silence was expected after the many arguments they'd had. I think that is best, Savannah. Neither anger nor kindness entered his tone. Frankly, you seem to have outgrown this town. For the sake of your happiness, your journey should include possibilities to the West. He retrieved his pipe from a pocket and motioned further inside the house. Now go on and eat your supper. Savannah gladly ate while telling her mother of her decision. Directly after her last bite was swallowed, she accepted her mother's embrace and headed off to read the matrimonial times by the light of her lantern. Although she had three sisters, all married, none of them were close. Perhaps her father had desired a son when she was born, so he had taught her to ride and shoot. She didn't blame him for her independence, though. She sighed and opened the paper. The first letter that she glanced was from a man in Montana. She shook her head. Montana was cold, ice cold. Only if she was desperate would she write a return letter to a man in Montana. Then again, I am desperate, she said with a trace of humor in her voice. But I'm still not going to Montana. She knocked out letters from Wyoming, which was icy cold too, and she ignored Arizona for being just as hot as Georgia in the summer and no fit place to be. Forty minutes later, she had narrowed her choices down to three letters. Her top choice was from a rancher in Easter Springs, located about a hundred miles northwest of Denver. The writer, a man named Ethan Waters, said he owned a ranch seven miles outside of town. What particularly interested her was that Mr. Waters said his place was a cattle ranch, and he also had five horses. He mentioned that he would teach his new wife to ride. Of course, Savannah knew how to ride, and five horses should give her a suitable choice. A knock sounded on her door, so she called out, Come in. Her favorite aunt and relative, Harriet, opened the door. Mind if I visit? Of course not. Savannah patted the bed beside her. Sit on the bed. By the way, I'm looking through the ads for mail-order brides like you suggested. Harriet nodded her head and her voice carried sadness. Savannah, I love you and my heart will ache when you leave. 
but this is best for you. You will get a second chance, a new life in the West, and I think it will be a good life. You're right, Auntie. There's no future here. And like you've been saying, I do stand out, especially when in Millersville. She lifted one shoulder in a half shrug. It's lonely here when I don't even get along with other girls. I understand, but the West will welcome you. Maybe you will be another Annie Oakley or Calamity Jane. Savannah smiled. Once, I thought I was odd, but then I read about Calamity and Annie. I loved them so much. They were like me, riding and shooting with the best of men. They seemed very happy, too, which gave me hope. Yes, the West does sound like the place for you, honey. She picked up the girl's brush and began to work the tangles out of her hair. And when you get out there, you write and let me know where you are. Your old auntie might want to visit. I've never even been to the Mississippi River, much less anything past there. Savannah reached over and grabbed her aunt's hand, stopping the brush's motion for a moment to say, You bet I will write, and you write back too. I will. Her aunt fondly stroked a finger over Savannah's cheek before continuing to brush her hair. Whoever you pick will think an angel dropped down from heaven for them. And I'll tell my future husband that I want a room for my auntie. I'm going to show her what the West is like. She smiled down at the newspaper, adding, Look at this. I think I'm going to write this man back. She showed her aunt the letter by Mr. Waters. Harriet read it slowly, then nodded. Yes, I think Mr. Waters is a good prospect. Savannah sighed as her aunt continued brushing her hair. For a moment, tears formed in her eyes. I know I don't belong here, but this is a big decision. If Mr. Waters accepts, I'll be going a thousand miles from what I call a home with no friends or family there. She shook her head. I like to think of myself as a courageous woman, but going. I have no one to turn to. Then a little choked laughter slipped out. Of course, I don't really have any female friends here, and all the men want a more refined and polite lady. You are a bit untamed, Savannah, but you have beauty on your side. Just don't try to boss your new husband around. He might not like it. I'll be proper and ladylike, she promised. Her aunt laughed. Be proper and ladylike for as long as you can. I love you, honey, but make sure your potential husband is an easygoing gentleman, a man who can tolerate a lot. Savannah put her hands on her hips and gave her aunt an exasperated smile. I'm not that bad, auntie. I've seen a few of the men stare in my direction. You are a fine-looking woman, no doubt. But for a husband, you need a man with a kind and understanding heart. Savannah held up the paper and tapped the advertisement with her finger. Mr. Waters says right here he doesn't have a temper, that he's kind and attends the community church out there in Easter Wells, and said the church has a real good minister. She tapped a finger on her chin as her brow wrinkled. You think all these guys tell the truth in their letters? There's one easy way to find out. What's that? Savannah's gaze slid sideways to her aunt. Ask him for money for the trip. If he gives it to you, he might be honest. Savannah laughed. Since I have very little money of my own, maybe I will do that. She reached in the drawer and brought out a quill. But I am definitely going to ask about the horses. I can't imagine not being able to ride. A man with five horses should make a good husband, she sighed. At least I hope so. Chapter 2 Ethan, this sounds like the perfect woman for you. Alice Longmont slapped the letter against her hand while looking at her brother. You have to stop this dithering around and make a decision. Ethan Waters, a tall man with dark eyes and a dark mustache, 
stood looking out toward the mountains. His home had large windows, so what he called the majestic mountains were always in sight. He was not religious, but he did go to church. The scenic beauty of the mountains was possibly one sign of the Almighty. Well, it's a big decision to make, Alice. I'm not buying a chair or a new shirt. This is a wife we're talking about. It's not something you should make a snap decision about. This has been months in the making, Ethan. It is not a snap decision at all. Alice tossed the letter onto a table. She had pushed and prodded him into putting an ad in the matrimonial times. Now, she shook her head and paced back and forth at his lack of enthusiasm over the reply. He couldn't help feeling like a cow lined up, waiting for a brand. But it is a major decision, Alice, he reminded her. She sighed heavily and nodded. Yes, and I know you don't like big decisions, and I know why. You're talking about a stranger stepping into my life, so I'm not sure. Yes, I understand. Ethan, you built this ranch up after Pa died, and you worked day and night to do it. You built it bit by bit, little by little, slow and steady. You don't like big decisions. You don't like taking a big chance, either personally or ranching. In fact, I don't think you have ever taken a big chance. You are a very cautious man which is a very good personal and business trait. She nodded. Yes, it is. I certainly won't argue that. But Ethan, I want this for your own good. At times, I don't see how you could be so focused on the ranch. No, I was going to say resistant to companionship. When father died, this ranch wasn't half as big as it is now. You built it on hard work and sweat and 12-hour days. You didn't even take Sunday afternoons off, which you know you are supposed to. You became very successful, but that came at a price. She sighed and started pacing again. You didn't even get out and meet many of the women in this area. Because of that, I doubt you could carry on a conversation if it didn't involve this farm. Well, I've never been a big talker especially to women. No, you haven't. You don't waste words. Using several when one would do talk. Your new bride better like the strong, silent type. She's not my new bride. That got him an impatient glare. He stuck his hands in his pockets to keep from throwing them in the air and included, yet, I'm still deciding. Well, you need to decide quickly. Alice tapped the letter. She sounds like a very intelligent woman who won't wait around for long. She mentioned her schooling, and you can tell she has a lot of learning. She picked up the letter and waved it at him. That quote in here is from Robert Browning. Grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. Rather creative for her to use that. Frankly, Ethan, you could use a little poetry in your soul and around this house, too. Hearing the line from that poem put the beginnings of a smile on his face. He was not a talker, but when he had time, he was a reader, enjoying books. Even an occasional book of poetry was one of his favorite pastimes. He was familiar with the line from Browning. It had impressed him. Alice was also right about how the letter read. It was written by an intelligent woman. There were a number of good points in her letter. He nodded slowly and admitted, I was impressed by it. Then don't waste time. Sit down, write her back, and send her money for train and stage tickets. He tried to imagine what this woman was really like. His silence seemed to infuriate his sister. Ethan, she's a fine woman and she likes horses. There you have two things in common which is more than a lot of marriages have. Besides, she is the one who would be taking all the risks here, not you. When he still didn't say anything, she stopped to face him. If you don't like her, you can send her packing back to Georgia. You'll still be in your home and in a town where you have friends and family. 
She'll be leaving hers behind. Honestly, Ethan, she's taking a major risk that's admirable and a lot of men wouldn't take. Anyone could lose everything, Alice. This ranch is not only meant for me and my sons. If you or your children ever need help, I will have the ability and the finances to help them. I've had success in the West, and others have seen bankruptcy, and you have to be on your guard all the time. And a stranger coming into his life put his guard up immediately. Alice was more trusting than him, but he understood that she didn't want him to be without children. He wasn't interested in what he'd seen from the women in town, nor was he up for their relatives, trying to sucker him out of land. I understand why you feel the need to guard the ranch, but she is taking most of the risk, and I don't want any letter from you to underwhelm her to death either. You have to admire her courage at the very least. She has courage. He nodded again, warming a little to the idea of companionship. You are right about that. Any woman is taking a big chance leaving her family in her hometown. And she likes horses. That's a good combination. Besides, you need a wife to have children. You carried out father's dream of a bigger ranch, and you know he would be very proud of you. Her voice softened. I know all that's part of the reason you work so hard. She picked up a small sketch from the table. She sent this along, probably a sketch done by a friend. Take a good look, Ethan. She is a fine-looking woman. You got lucky, and you don't want to ignore good luck. If you do, it may take off, and you'll only have bad luck. I may not talk much, he gave a wry smile, but you certainly have a gift for conversation, Alice, and I try to use it wisely. Now sit down and write that letter and send her the money. He smiled, walked to a chair, and took the quill from Alice's hand. Guess I should give it a try. And she is good looking, he said, pausing with quill in his hand. And she quotes Browning. Looking down at the thick paper, he still didn't write anything as he thought aloud. I've been alone for a while. I just don't like taking chances. I... He almost set the unused quill down when his sister said, You need a wife, Ethan, and this Georgia gal is about as good as you're going to get. Chapter 3 at the stage depot, Savannah drank half a glass of water, then handed the empty glass back to the clerk. Thank you very much, she said. Anything else I can do for you? The clerk asked. No, I'll just wait here for the stage. Easter Springs had no train stop. The closest depot was Fall River. From there, she had to take a stage to get to her destination. She hadn't minded the train ride, but was not sure how she would like the stage ride on a bumpy road. It should be along any minute now. The stage is going to change horses, but that shouldn't take long. You should be on your way in about 15 minutes. Looks like you've traveled a long way. Savannah nodded. From South Georgia. The only good thing about this trip is South Georgia is a place you want to be from not be in. The clerk smiled. If there's anything else I can do, just let me know. He returned behind his desk as a well-dressed man in a black coat and silver vest walked in. He tipped his hat at Savannah, who politely nodded back at him. What can I do for you, sir? The clerk said. A ticket to Durango, the man said. Yes, sir. You have business in Durango. Of a sort. The type of business where you are sitting around a table and being dealt jacks and queens. Savannah smiled. His voice was friendly, sounded honest, and had a trace of humor, even though the man was just making small talk. He walked over and sat down with her on the waiting bench. Something about him, maybe his age, which she guessed to be mid-forties, reminded her of his father. Brett Holiday, ma'am, he tipped his hat again. No relation to the more famous Doc Holiday, 
although we may be 55th cousins or something akin to that. She offered her hand for him to shake. Very pleased to meet you, Mr. Holliday. Call me Brett. When she started to protest, he raised his hand. I know that's not generally done, but in the West we're a bit flexible. Besides, I've always thought Mr. Holliday was my father. She smiled. Even so, and although it is clear you are a gentleman, I think I should call you Mr. Holliday. As you please, ma'am. The clerk gasped and pointed to Mr. Holliday. You're him. You really are him. Mr. Holliday looked a bit uncomfortable. I guess I might be. Who are you talking about? You're the man who rode with Sheriff Bill Woodward to take down Black Jack Holton and two of his gang members, one of the most vicious outlaws in the territory. He looked at Savannah. This is a hero. A lot of men were scared to ride against Black Jack Holton, but this man did. Mr. Holliday flashed an uneasy smile at Savannah and shook his head. It wasn't really that heroic, ma'am. Mr. Holton had some of my money, and I just wanted to get it back. He sure did, the clerk said. He and the sheriff shot and killed the two gang members and brought Holton back alive. He was hung a few days ago. The town made Mr. Holliday here an honorary citizen and gave him a nice proclamation. They did say a lot of nice things about me, Mr. Holliday said. You must be a very honorable man, Mr. Holliday, Savannah said. Well, actually, ma'am, I just have a fondness for my money and don't like people stealing it from me. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. I'm Savannah Walton. I'm traveling to Easter Springs. Heard that's a nice little town. I enjoy small towns, but I can't make my living in one. I heard what you said to the clerk. May I assume you're a gambler? Yes, ma'am. He gave her a slow, single nod and grinned. When I'm not chasing outlaws, which I don't usually do. You don't have to worry about meeting outlaws on this trip, ma'am the clerk said. Mr. Holliday is a gentleman. He'll be protecting you. Now I can agree to being a gentleman, Mr. Holliday nodded. At your service, ma'am. Savannah chuckled. So, how did you get into the gambling business, Mr. Holliday? Since I'm a gentleman, I would prefer you call me Brett, ma'am. My papa was and is a gambling man. To him, it was a fine profession. He told me, for most of history, kings and queens were not on the side of the average fellow. They lorded over common folks. But these days, he said the average fellow can get kings and queen to work and make a lot of money for him. Well, as a lady, I insist on calling you Mr. Holiday, Savannah said. I imagine what your papa said was true, but I don't think you could ever be mistaken for an average fellow. Thank you, ma'am. That's very nice of you. Mr. Holliday showed his wide smile again. To be honest, most of the time the cards are on my side. I've made a good living sitting around poker tables. Is that why you're going to Durango, she asked, for a poker game? Yes, Durango is not that big, but there are a few rather wealthy Coloradans in that region who enjoy poker and have a tournament every year. They play poker for five days or until everybody runs out of money. I plan to attend this year. So, are you from Durango? She was compelled to ask. No, I just happen to have been favored with an invitation. It was very nice of those gentlemen to offer me one. Table limits are $10,000. Add five men to that and you have $50,000 which is not bad for a week's work. You sound very confident. He nodded. I am. I know the game of poker. My papa taught me to play when I was six. You must be very brave to trust your future to cards, she said. Brave or foolish, he arched a brow and grinned, depending on your point of view. They heard the stage couch pull up outside before shouts of, 
Take those horses down to the stable and bring up six fresh ones. We'll see if we can make Durango tonight. Our next run isn't until 11 tomorrow. The driver walked in, saw the two passengers, and said, Be just about 15 minutes, folks, and then we'll load up. How long to Easter Springs? Savannah asked. That trip will take about two hours, and that includes a stop where you can rest your legs. By the way, why are you heading to Easter Springs? Mr. Holliday said. Hopefully, to meet my husband. I'm a mail-order bride. He gave another friendly smile. Your future husband is a very fortunate man. Thank you. You told me I was brave. To be truthful, I tend to avoid dangerous situations unless someone steals from me. He motioned toward her and continued. You are the brave one. You're traveling to a state where you know no one and no one knows you, all to marry a man you have never seen. Now, that takes courage. Then he tapped his chest. I'll just stick to playing cards, which doesn't require bravery. But if there's anything I can do for you, just let me know. Thank you. That's very kind and gracious, Mr. Holliday. Chapter 4 Attorney Jarrett Crown leaned back in his chair and stuck a cigar between his lips. Flicking the end of a match with his thumbnail, he brought the flaring orange flame up to light the cigar as he eyed Ethan. A couple of deep puffs sent gray smoke pluming around him before he removed the cigar from his mouth. You came here for legal advice, Ethan, so perhaps I shouldn't say this is not the most optimistic way to enter into a marriage, even a mail-order marriage. That's not my legal opinion. Crown said, I understand, but I need to know what's involved in this, Jarrett, after years and years of building up acre after acre at the Barwa. I have to know the consequences of any decision. I have to make sure all that hard work isn't taken from me. He snapped his fingers. Like that. I know the personal consequences of a mail-order marriage. I need to know the legal consequences for the bar W if something goes wrong. Crown nodded, one eye closed and the other squinting at Ethan through a thicker fog of cigar smoke. You know I don't like taking risks, Jarrett, personal or legal, and especially with the Bar W at stake. Right now, it's the biggest ranch in the region. I want to keep it that way. Ethan, I have to research this. Even though Ethan didn't know how he saw where to flick the end of the cigar, ash fell into the ashtray. Let's say... There was a marriage, but for some reason, things fell apart. Perhaps the young lady returned to her hometown or left for another town in Colorado. Well then, most of your assets would be secure. Since you invited the lady out here, though, there would be some financial obligations. Crown drew on his cigar at the same time he funneled smoke out the other side of his mouth. But Ethan... I've known you for years, and I know the type of man you are. If things went wrong, I'm sure you would provide financially for the lady because of your sense of obligation. I don't think the law would make you do more than you do. In fact, I feel sure you would be more generous than the law. I'd share the responsibility. He nodded. I would not leave the lady destitute. You're right about that. I would ensure she had enough finances to start a new life, either back in her hometown, if she chose to go there, or in another town. But I want to make sure the ranch wouldn't be endangered in any way. Ethan, I don't know much about mail-order brides. I already have a wife, but I do know that the two people do not get marriage on the first day she arrives. They take time to get to know one another. The lady lives in a friend's home or at a boarding house for a while. If that's not possible, she stays in the house of her pending groom, in a separate room, of course. During that time, you must make the decision of whether you think this woman should become your wife. 
You have a sound mind, so I'm sure you will make the right decision. To be truthful, I don't think you'll need any legal protections. Ethan nodded, but he said, As a precaution, I don't want to leave anything to chance. It's that thing with risks and chances. If you lose, everything might be lost. Well, you always were a cautious man, Ethan. And I plan to stay that way, Ethan said. Watching the build of Ash miss the ashtray this time, mail order bride law is a relatively new area, but some legislators have passed statutes to protect the bride because they realized how vulnerable the women are. I will need to research those laws because, to be honest, this is the first time I've had such a question. I've heard there have been times when the mail order bride has returned east after the proposed matrimony has not worked out. I want to make sure the bar W is absolutely secure if something goes wrong. I don't want a woman to become my wife and then leave in six months or a year and get to claim a portion of the ranch. If she finds a lawyer, such as H. Wilbur Ranger, who knows what will happen? Crown puffed again on his cigar. Ranger, the blackjack Holton of attorneys, was skilled but lacked ethics. He was rumored to have bribed a few judges on behalf of his clients. The charges had never been proven, but a number of his clients had walked away from trials with big settlements. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor, hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now back to our story. I understand your concern, Ethan. And I certainly understand how you feel about the ranch. I suppose I could draw up a legal agreement for you and your mail order bride to sign. In addition to the marital pact, that would give you additional protection. That would strengthen your financial position if anything goes wrong. Without giving any of the bar W away, Crown nodded. Although I must tell you, I think you are being extra cautious, Ethan. In regards to the bar W, there is no such thing as being extra cautious, Ethan said. I've always been extra cautious in making decisions about the ranch, and I'm going to stay that way. Ethan, we're friends. And again, I know you came in to seek legal advice, not marital advice. But it seems to me that you're looking at the young lady as a potential adversary, not as a bride and partner. That's not a good way to enter into a marriage. Know anything about ranching or farming, Jared? No, can't say that I do. He billowed smoke into the air. Jared, in ranching and farming, weather can be a friend or enemy, but disease is an enemy. There's a half dozen diseases that can kill cattle. Bugs, pests, and wild animals are also your enemies. Drought and flooding are your enemy. And then there's outlaws and rustlers, along with a great many things I haven't mentioned. You don't have that many friends out there on the plains, but you fight to survive. You make one mistake with any one or thing on that list, and it can destroy you. So you stay prepared, Crown said, nodding vigorously. Ethan nodded in response. Yes, I stay prepared, because this land means everything. I'll get working on what you need, Ethan. The cigar's glowing tip pointed at him. Thank you, Jarrett, he said. Chapter 5 Savannah tapped the corner of her mouth with a finger. You know there is something I'd like to ask of you. Go right ahead, Mr. Holliday said. I need to know the ways of the West. In his letters, my future husband mentioned he played an occasional game of poker. I don't know much about the game. Perhaps I should learn. Such knowledge might come in handy. Could you teach me the game on the way to Easter Springs? Certainly. It doesn't take long to learn. Takes a lifetime to master, but a short time to learn. When the driver yelled for the horses to begin the trip to Easter Springs, Holiday put his suitcase between him and Savannah. 
He reached into his coat and pulled out a deck of cards. Let's start with the basics, he said as he pulled two kings from the desk. Two of anything are two of a kind. However, two of a kind can be beaten by two pairs, say a pair of eights and a pair of queens. You can win a hand with two pair, but you want one of those pairs to be face cards. Face cards? Jack to an ace, Mr. Holiday said. Three of a kind is just what the name states. Three sevens or three jacks or three aces. Three aces is a good hand, especially in five-card stud. Less good, though, in five-cards draw. And what is... We'll get into that. When we get to Easter Springs, Miss Walton, you'll be a pro. She smiled. Thank you. I'm sure most ladies don't ask a gentleman to teach her poker, but I've always been a go-for-broke type. I'm sure you have, he nodded toward her. And that's a compliment, ma'am. It is beautiful country, Savannah said. She had just handed all the cards back to Mr. Holiday and thanked him for the lessons. She looked out the window toward the mountains, capped with snow. Yes, Colorado has some of the finest scenery in the nation. It is truly a beautiful state. She kept staring at the mountains. The jagged peaks seemed to carry a vast dignity. There was a majesty in the mountains. They were so high and huge. Humans seemed puny in relation to them. Brown and green mixed on the mountainside. Green grass and leaves on the trees against brown trunks of the trees. On the top of the mountain was a layer of snow, sparking white. I'm sure now that you are in Colorado... You will eventually travel and see the Continental Divide, which is the most magnificent piece of real estate on the face of the earth, Mr. Holliday said. Words cannot describe it. No, they can't, Savannah said. This scene, somehow it gives you hope, hope for the future, hope for everything. I haven't had hope for a long time. I guess I thought it stopped existing, but it didn't. Hope was out here, in Colorado, not back in Georgia. Mr. Holliday nodded. Well, life here will have its challenges, but dreams can be fulfilled here. I think there is a sense of optimism in the West. Thousands, tens of thousands come out here, seeking a new life and a new chance. Some do fail, but many achieve it. Savannah suddenly realized she was very tired. She had been traveling most of the day. As the stage turned away from the mountain, it receded from her view. She eased back on the seat and put her head against the wall of the coach and closed her eyes. Sorry, my energy seems to have run out. I need a nap, she told him. Go ahead and doze off if you can. Not easy to sleep in a stage. But as he finished the sentence, he saw Savannah's eyes were shut and she seemed to already be asleep. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday looked at her with respect and affection. He had used the gun he carried three times when sore loses caused a saloon fight. Once, he drew it so fast that it shocked his opponent, who raised his hands in surrender before his fingers touched the pistol's handle. Another time, he had shot and killed an opposing player who had called him a cheat and had drawn on him. The last time he pulled his weapon, he wounded another man. But as he looked at the sleeping woman, he knew she faced more difficult challenges than he ever did. She traveled close to 2,000 miles to a rugged land, not knowing a soul or having a friend, to marry a man she had never met. And she faced challenges that could not be resolved by a gun. He doubted he would have had the courage that she had. She was a beautiful woman, too, he thought. The chestnut hair and honey eyes made her distinctive. And although she was weary from the long journey and uneasy traveling alone, there was a vitality to her voice. He hoped she had picked a good husband. In a poker game, he had often made large bets 
when he had control of the circumstances. He seized up the odds and made a wager, but he could have passed on the hand or even stepped away from the table. No matter the situation, he had a degree of control. But Savannah Walton, the young lady from Georgia, had little or no control over her situation. She was a stranger in a savage land with no allies as yet. He knew if for some reason everything went south for him, or if he made a stupid bet and was wiped out in a poker game, he could always travel back to Texas and be welcomed home by his papa. But Savannah could not go back to Georgia. During their conversation, she had hinted that Path was no longer available to her security. What security did she have? He reached into his pocket and drew out several papers. If you cast your bread upon the waters, you'll just get soggy bread, his papa had said once. Then he had grinned and said in a thoughtful tone, But I do believe if you do good deeds, somehow they will return to you. Do so many, Brett, that the returns will be so many that they will have to be carried by train. Holiday always thought that was good advice. He tried to live by that one rule. Fifteen minutes later, the stage stopped at the Durango office. The driver climbed down and opened the door. Durango, folks, you can step out and stretch your legs. Clem, our man here, usually has some fresh, cool water and a biscuit or two for passengers. It was a pleasure meeting you, ma'am, he said, helping Savannah from the stage. It was a pleasure to meet you, too. I never dreamed I'd have such interesting company when I stepped onto the train back in Georgia. I appreciate the compliment, Miss Walton. He walked her up the steps to the depot and opened the door for her. He tipped his hat. I'm off to find a hotel room and the poker game, but I wanted to give you this before I go. He handed her an envelope. You can read it at your leisure. What is this, Mr. Holliday? Oh, just some advice about the West that you may find helpful, he said. Thanks. I will definitely read it, and I will remember you when I leave. He smiled and tipped his hat again. Savannah. Fifteen minutes later, sitting alone in the coach, Savannah opened the envelope and brought out the contents. She was shocked when she saw the four fifty-dollar bills. She shook her head as she fingered the bills. She had never seen a fifty-dollar bill before, much less four of them. At first, she was almost embarrassed, thinking she should hide the money and hastily shoved it under her dress. She swallowed, thought for a moment, then brought her fingers out from under her skirt and looked at the money again. A stranger gave her two hundred dollars? She knew how long her father would have worked for that amount of money, and Mr. Holliday casually hands it over to a woman he doesn't know. The West is a bit stranger than I thought, she said. She folded the money and inserted it into her purse. She reached into the envelope again and brought out the letter. She unfolded it and started reading. Dear Savannah, I'm sure, to a stranger, this might be a frightening land. And of course, it can be frightening and dangerous, but it can also be wonderful. Every traveler needs money so I wanted to give you this gift of stability. If the marriage works out, and I earnestly hope it will, if so, then you may not need this. But if your expected plans don't pan out, then you will have a little security to fall back. I wanted to tell you something about Western men, but if there is one trait that women might find irritating, it's that men out here are not the talkative type. They are reserved, laconic, but I'm sure women would prefer husbands speak more than two words to them during an evening at home. Frankly, that's often the conversational style among men in the West. It may be jarring to someone from the East, so you may need to prepare for it. However, if things don't work and you're wondering what to do, I just want to tell 
that there's a little place down in White Deer, Texas, about 20 miles northeast of Amarillo, with the holiday brand on it, my papa, with distinguished old gentlemen, will tell you pithy sayings and is not silent and laconic. He is talkative and he loves having someone to listen to him. As soon as I get settled in Durango, I plan to write my papa a letter telling him I met you and to possibly expect a visit. This would give you the option if, as I noted, things don't work out. If not, you would be stuck here. Now you would have a little security. But I wish you the best and hope the marriage does work out. All my best. Brett Holiday. For a moment, Savannah stared, mouth open at the letter. She couldn't believe it. It was more than a minute before she responded. Apparently, Western men are very generous, too, she said softly. For a moment, tears formed in her eyes, and one rolled down her cheek. She was afraid more would come, so she hastily grabbed a hanky from her purse and wiped her eye. She guessed she had spent an hour or perhaps ninety minutes with Mr. Holiday in the coach, but he had been kinder to her and gave her more encouragement than her father had during her entire life. She sighed, stretched her legs out, and leaned back. Gosh, it's a shame Mr. Holiday didn't want a mail-order bride, she said. I don't think I'd mind a gambler for a husband, she smiled. I don't think my husband will be as smooth a talker as Brett, but I'm sure he'll be a good man. She paused for a moment. And he does have five horses on his ranch. She listened to the clatter of the horse's hoofs on the road. It wouldn't be long until the stage pulled up in Easter Springs. Twenty minutes later, the six horses slowed as the driver pulled into the depot. Savannah sighed with relief. When the driver opened the door, she gave him her hand to help her out of the stage. The man riding shotgun untied her two bags and tossed them down to the driver. A pleasure having you ride with us, ma'am. Hope it wasn't too bumpy for you, the driver said. Not at all. I enjoyed the trip. The ride was scenic. Thank you, ma'am. He looked around. Are you expecting anyone? Before she could answer, a buckboard swung around the corner with a tall, broad-shouldered man driving. He pulled the buckboard behind the stage and climbed down. Savannah tried to suppress a smile. It probably was proper to be dignified when you met your husband, not kick your heels up. The man was very good-looking, with dark hair, fine features accentuated by dimpled cheeks, and a cleft chin, gray eyes, and a nice smile. He caught her gawking at him and took off his hat as he approached. Are you, you, Savannah Walton, she said, offering her hand. Are you the man expecting a mail-order bride? He swallowed before answering and looked uncomfortable. Yes, ma'am. His lips barely let out the two words. Ethan. Ethan Waters could hardly breathe, as if her beauty had paralyzed his lungs. The chestnut-haired woman named Savannah Walton was lovelier than anything he'd expected. She had golden, vibrant hair emerald green eyes, and flawless skin with high cheekbones and a pink flush on the apple of her cheeks. Why would such a beauty place herself in the mail-order bride position? Was she running from something or someone? The thought sent an icy chill trickling down his back. A sharp pang of regret over his positive answer rolled in his stomach. Careful. I just have to take care. I, I'm Ethan Waters, he stammered. Mr. Waters, I'm so happy to meet you, although perhaps considering our relationship, she rushed on. I should start calling you Ethan. Please call me Savannah. Savannah, he gave a slight nod, struggling with the need to tap his toes on the hard dirt. For a moment, both stood in silence, looking at one another. Savannah's gaze searched his face, as though waiting for something, 
possibly a few words about how happy he was to see her or maybe how attractive she looked. Unused to conversing with women, Ethan just stood there until he looked down at her things. Uh, let me help you with your luggage. Thank you. She sounded a little baffled, and had he detected relief? Ethan took her two bags and placed them into the buckboard. He swore the few people bustling about were staring at them. His awkwardness around crowds, even three to four people, filled his very soul. When he turned back, they made eye contact once again. He sensed a force, a strength born from determination beneath the chestnut hair, honey eyes, and natural beauty. What have I gotten myself into? Ethan realized that femininity was staring back at him. He quickly lowered his gaze while wondering what he could do to get to know her before she set her sights on his ranch. A meal. I don't have to talk if I have food in my mouth. Rolled through his mind. Are you hungry? I imagine you might be after the long trip. My ranch is about eight miles away, but Empire Springs has a very good restaurant. Yes, I am a little hungry. There was definite relief in her tone. I would not mind having dinner. It's a short walk to the restaurant, Ethan said, hefting her luggage onto his shoulder. Chapter 6 They strolled two blocks to a place named the Mountain Diner. It was early for dinner, so only about a quarter of the tables were occupied. A woman greeted them when they entered. Hello, Ethan, she said, flashing a big smile. Friendliness flowed from her like a wave in the sea. Ethan, I heard you were seeking a bride. Is this the lovely woman? Yes, ma'am, Savannah offered her hand. My name is Savannah Walton. I'm from Georgia. Welcome to Easter Springs. The woman took Savannah's hand and held it between both of hers. It's good to have you here, Savannah. I'm Mabel Hancock. My husband Bill and I own this establishment, been here for 20 years. Thank you, ma'am. So far, Savannah liked the little town, but every time she showed the slightest relief, Ethan's eyes narrowed. It's been said that Mabel and Bill are the best cooks around, Ethan said. Are you a skilled cook? I'm sure I'm not as good at cooking as my mother, or perhaps Mabel and Bill, but I've had a few compliments. Chuckling, Mabel patted Ethan on the shoulder. I'm sure she'll do just fine. Then she addressed Savannah as she seated them at a table. You've got a good man here. We all like Ethan. She handed them thick paper menus and continued. Today, we have my specially baked apple pies, which, if I do say so, are scrumptious. She's not just bragging, Ethan said. Can I bring you coffee or something? We have wonderful iced tea, Savannah. That sounds nice, especially after a long trip. Savannah's throat tingled in anticipation. I'll get you a glass. How about you, Ethan? Yes, please. Mabel walked back to the kitchen. Savannah noticed her future husband seemed to be struggling, as if he wanted to say something, but wasn't sure if he could get the words out. Er, Savannah, the way the mail order bride process usually works is the two people generally do not get married immediately. He turned the menu over and over in his hands as he added, they take time to get to know one another. She nodded. Yes, that's what it said in the matrimonial times. In addition to printing all the letters, the back page gives details about the process. He continued as though she hadn't spoken. The bride has a chance to get used to her new surroundings and to her husband. This is certainly a big change for both of us. He sounded like he'd memorized the wording. At a loss to add anything significant, Savannah simply said, Yes, it is. I have family in town. My sister has a large house with her husband. You can stay there. He continued to fidget with the menu. 
they have an extra room or um, you can stay at my ranch house while we are. Get to know one another, Savannah said when he didn't finish. Yes, I have an extra room at the ranch too, so you have a choice of where to stay. Are your horses at your ranch? She asked. I'm looking forward to seeing your horses. I rode a bit back in Georgia and would like to continue riding here in Colorado. Certainly, he nodded. I have a chestnut mare at the ranch that I think you would like. She's very fast but gentle. You could be the perfect rider for her. Thank you. Horses, I think, are wonderful animals. Riding gives one a sense of freedom, don't you think? He nodded but said nothing else. She wondered if he suspected what she was about to suggest. Well, she tried to make her voice soft, which wasn't as easy as she thought. Since you have horses, I would like to come out and stay at your ranch. I'm very excited about exploring and getting used to living there. His study of her was so intense, she felt compelled to add, After all, if everything works out, it will be my new home. Muscles tensed in his neck and jaw, and his eyes hardened. Mabel appeared with their iced tea and placed the glasses before them. Ethan immediately picked his up and took a long swallow. Would you like to order now? Mabel asked. Savannah? Um, yes. She hoped getting some food in his stomach might relax him. I've been told the steaks are very good in Colorado. They are. Most of our steers are corn-fed beef, Mabel told her, which makes them tender and juicy, and we know just how to cook them. Once you eat our steaks, you won't forget them. That's right, Ethan said. He had relaxed but still looked a bit disgruntled. Since I may be cooking a lot, Savannah said, taking the chance to try to better his mood further. Could you give me a few pointers, Mabel? A recipe or two? I sure will. She smiled at Savannah and tapped the menu. Our basic beefsteak is a favorite of customers. The trimmings of the day are mashed potatoes with succulent gravy and fresh corn. Plus, don't forget the apple pie. Oh, that sounds wonderful, Savannah said, her stomach already grumbling. I'll take it. So will I, Ethan said in a broody tone. Be back in a few minutes, Mabel said, glancing at Ethan. You look as hungry as bear fresh out of hibernation. She reached out and grabbed Savannah's hand. I want to welcome you again to Easter Springs. I know the town will be better since you arrived. Thank you. And Sunday, you must come in and listen to Reverend Elijah Terrell. He's the pastor of the local church and gives a good sermon. Our church service is almost a meeting place for much of the town. Reverend Terrell does the marrying, the christening, and the burying, and does a good job on all three. I would like to hear him. Good, she patted Ethan on the shoulder. You keep Ethan here coming on Sunday. His sister and her husband are in the pews every week. Ethan's attendance has been a bit more spotty, but I'd guess he's working. You nudge him out of that barn and into church. Mabel, Ethan scowled at her. I've been a regular the last couple of months. We've said hello to one another a number of times on Sunday, and that was in the church, not my barn. Mabel winked at Savannah, making her chuckle. Mabel seemed to poking at Ethan to get him to talk. Savannah liked her already. She turned her attention to Ethan. He must be very skilled, she thought, studying his tanned face. But why is he avoiding eye contact with me? I look forward to seeing the ranch, she said, trying to bring him into a conversation. And you may have to be a bit patient about the cooking. I lived in my parents' house back in Georgia, and my mother did much of the cooking. She enjoyed preparing the meals and I didn't get much chance in edging her out of the kitchen. That's understandable. His smile was polite but forced. Have you done your own cooking? Savannah asked, smiling brightly. 
I bet my cooking is better than yours. Maybe. She kept her smile in place. That was a joke, Ethan. He stared at her, silent for a moment, and then admitted, I'm not too good with humor. She hid her disappointment. She valued humor, but hadn't seen much in Georgia. She had hoped he would value it, too. Her smile wavered, but she forced it back into one that wasn't quite as bright. Ethan politely smiled back before he broke eye contact again. What in the world is going on in his mind? Chapter 7 He tried to avoid looking at Savannah, but it wasn't easy. Ethan's gaze took in the other diners instead, but he didn't want to stare rudely at anyone. As he looked around, he caught glances of her. He was tempted to say, let me look at you, although he had already liked very much what he had seen. If he looked into her swirling honey eyes for too long, he feared he'd start drooling, so he played at being standoffish. The problem was that she was just as easy to talk to as she was to look at, even after a thousand-mile journey. And now, he had to figure out the most important thing of his life. Just how genuine was this beautiful young woman sitting opposite him? Could he trust what she said, how she acted? Was she really greedy? Did she have a man back home waiting for word about wiggling her way into a rancher's life? And how did he get answers to these questions? Alice, she's a good judge of character. I have to get to know her, though. I hope you like the town, he said. It seems very nice, Ethan, but I'm a little anxious to see your horses and the ranch. Would she so readily admit this if she was working to con me? Or is Jarrett right? Am I being too cautious? It may be too dark to see anything tonight, but I can show it to you tomorrow. We can ride all over the property so you can get a good look at everything. I'm looking forward to it, she said, smiling wider, which gave him hope. It's very scenic. You can see the mountains and lovely areas for the horses to run. He pictured it, getting caught up in his mental image. There's a little brook running through the ranch where you can sit and watch nature. It's a very peaceful place. Have you had much peace in your life? Not much. Her tone and smile softened. It seemed his description had brought her peace. Not much at all. I want to see that little place. Maybe that little brook and the peace you talk about is kind of symbolic of this life. It can be, Ethan said, wanting to add, if you're a genuine soul. Mabel brought two plates and quickly set them before Savannah and Ethan. Eat up, folks. Savannah, you'll need your strength out here. It's a great place, but it makes people rugged. Ethan won't let any grass grow under his feet. You should expect to be kept busy. I'll try my best to keep up with him, Savannah said, smiling. Then you'll fit in fine here. Now get to eating before that grows cold. Both picked up their fork and knife. Savannah tasted the beef and sat back with a long sigh. The corn and potatoes were also first rate. Savannah ate faster than he'd seen some men eat. Ethan had never seen a woman handle a meal so quickly. As he chewed, he thought about the small study that Alice had talked him into building, and he remembered the quote from Savannah's letter. While she was between bites, he said, um, my sister and I were impressed by your letter, so impressed that she talked me into building you a small study. He suddenly felt a little foolish for his earlier doubts. He needed to at least give her a chance. So, you like to read? Oh, yes, she almost shouted, then lowered her voice. Ethan, that's, that's a wonderful thing to do and very thoughtful. She gave him a beautiful smile. One of the few pleasures at home was my parents' belief in a good education for us. We had a small library. Any chance I got, I loved to read. Ethan smiled and relaxed a little. 
Leaning forward, he described the library. It's a fair-sized room toward the back of the house. If you get up early, you can see our wonderful sunrise, which is surrounded by pink and reds so powerful, you think the whole horizon is on fire. Sunsets here can be just as stirring. Yes, I'm sure it is. She breathed. In face of her awe, she had abandoned the piece of steak on her fork. He couldn't resist describing more. The study has a desk, table, and a chair, and a bookshelf. You have room to sit or roam about a bit. Oh, I can't wait to see it, she beamed at him. The skin on the back of his prickled, as if someone was watching them. The sensation reminded him that they were sitting in Mabel's diner. With that reminder, the need to rush them through dinner and leave for home burned hotter than a brush fire. Is everything okay? Her smile dimmed with every word. Talk of home is making me impatient to get back, he shrugged to add weight to his words. She nodded, smiling wider, and pointed her fork toward her food. Let's finish so we can get back then. Ethan liked the way she grew excited by going home, too. She didn't seem the type to dwell around merchant stores for the newest this or that. He might not know too much about women, but, from what he'd heard, some liked acquiring fanciful items that put a major dent in a man's pocket. At the first signs of greed, though, he could always send her back to Georgia. So far, her beauty and laughter showed him what he'd been missing. Maybe seeking a mail-order bride wasn't a bad decision after all. Mabel served them her apple pie, and while they ate, she told him about her upbringing and spoke of her siblings. The subject of drink came up, so he admitted, Occasionally, I do have a sip of whiskey on our porch at the end of the day. My mother used to drink a bit of wine, but I never saw her or my father drink too much. In such a setting, a sip of wine or whiskey seems like the thing to do, Savannah said. A lot of church people object to alcohol, but even our local parson doesn't object to parishioners having a sip at the end of the day. Remembering that conversation, he shook his head in exasperation. One or two of the congregants became angry, though, and I think two members left the church. Savannah chuckled. This sounds like a likely town. Lively but peaceful, he agreed. I wanted to ask about dime novels to do with the West. Back in Georgia, there were so many that people buzzed around talking about the book's wild stories. You usually don't have gunfights at dawn in the streets here, do you? or Indians attacking the town and scalping the residents. He chuckled and shook his head. Don't believe those. A friend of mine brought some back from the east. He said he laughed so hard he almost fell out of his chair. With wide eyes, she asked, So they are not honest? No, I read one and threw it out. They're just trash. But I will say that later I read another and thought it was amusing. I think it had a character named Donald Taggart. Something about rounding up an outlaw gang and killing a few of the members. They called him Dead Eye Don't in the novel. Giggling, Savannah asked. So, no Dead Eye Don's live near here? Our sheriff's name is Don Meadows. He got so annoyed after several folks called him Dead Eye Don. Ethan chuckled at the memory. If that writer ever came to town the sheriff might just toss him in jail. When she sat her fork on her plate, he suggested, Are you ready to head out to the ranch? My sister Alice is there. She wanted to welcome you. That's very nice of her. Yes, I'm through. Thank you for the dinner. She picked up her glass, which still had a swallow of iced tea. I don't want to waste any of this. That's good to hear, Ethan thought. You're welcome. He downed the last of his iced tea, too, before adding, I have a good team of horses. This ride shouldn't be too bumpy or as long. He paid the bill and escorted Savannah to the carriage. 
two gray horses were hitched to the team. With his help, Savannah climbed into the buggy and he settled in beside her. He flicked the reins and the horses trotted down the street. The bright crescent moon shone over the trees as they rode out of town. Savannah glanced at the distant mountains, bathed in moonlight. North Georgia had mountains, but the South was flat land. They're beautiful, she said, awed by the towering cliffs, especially in the moonlight. Yes, they are. I say a man is never lonely around the forest and the mountains, not when surrounded by nature. She nodded. I understand. A furry creature scrambled across the road. Oh, squirrels chatter to other animals in the woods. The woods may be peaceful, but they're not always quiet, he said. I think that was a opossum. A lot of our furry friends are cute, but they're not always nice. Opossums can be downright mean. They will attack and kill cats and other small pets. I don't have cats, but there are two dogs at the ranch, pretty good sized. But they don't intimidate the opossums who might prefer fighting to fleeing. He flicked the reins again. The steady hoofbeats echoed along the road as the horses increased their speed. You mentioned that you ride, Savannah, he said, talking to her more than he'd spoken to anyone in months. So, I should tell you, we have to deal with larger animals than opossums here, too. I have eight horses in the barn. Most often, if a cougar or mountain lion is spotted, I keep them inside the barn. They won't usually attack horses, but it's been known to happen. He glanced over, appearing quite handsome in the moonlight as he added, The horses also roam free in a big pasture, with a stream where I keep bales of hay. She nodded, too dumbstruck by the beauty surrounding them to speak. Do you know anything about guns? he asked. Yes, I shoot. Awe hung in her voice. To be honest, I was a better shot than most men in my hometown. Good. In the West, you need to know how to shoot, he smiled. You might have to defend the horses once in a while. I don't mean to scare you. I don't scare easily, she said quickly and I don't mind defending them. She caught his eye and wondered if it was just the moonlight or true admiration she saw. Those animals should know to flee, not stay to fight when they see me with a gun. He didn't comment, so she was left to wonder if she'd said too much. But they turned a bend in the road, and a beautiful ranch house came into view. Lantern light glowed through the windows, when Ethan pulled the buggy to a stop, a woman stepped out the front door and waved to the two. Ethan waved back and turned to Savannah. That's Alice, my sister. I'll get your luggage and take it to your room. Then I need to go to the barn and unhitch and feed the horses. Savannah followed him toward the house. Alice was taller than most ladies, about 5'7", with a plain but pleasant face brown hair and eyes and a wide smile. She projected friendliness and couldn't seem to stop smiling. Instead of shaking Savannah's hand, Alice pulled her into a hug. It's so good to have you here. I've been looking forward to meeting you, she said, squeezing Savannah's breath from her lungs. Thank you. Finally released, Savannah gulped a lungful of air and grinned back. That's a wonderful welcome, um... She didn't know what her last name was or what to call her. Please call me Alice. I won't take up much of your time tonight. You have to be exhausted from that journey. Words gush from Alice, the way water gushed down one of the Colorado streams. When Ethan gets your luggage into your room, I'll make sure you're settled in for a good night's sleep. I know a life change like this must be overwhelming. I don't want you to feel alone. Thank you so much. Savannah smiled and clasped Alice's hand. I must admit to thinking I'm a pretty strong and confident woman, but I have had plenty of fears and doubts about this. 
Sometimes, sometimes every fear in the world tries to attack you, Alice said, squeezing Savannah's hands. Yes, that's so true. I thought I wouldn't have a friend in the world here. She smiled again. Um, but I see I have one now. Yes, you do. Come, let me show you your room. Alice walked through the living room and down a hall to a bedroom where a large bed was covered with a blue bedspread, a bureau drawer with a pitcher and a washboard atop, and two chairs were also in the room. It's lovely, Savannah said. I'm so glad you like it. Did Ethan tell you about the study? Yes, thank you. That's so thoughtful of you both. Savannah could feel the exhaustion creeping into her bones, but she fought it. It's right down the hall. Would you like to take a look? Alice asked, and Savannah nodded. Savannah followed her new friend down the hall and into another room. Alice flicked a match and lit two candles. The room was not fancy, but the simplicity of it almost took Savannah's breath away. A table, large desk, and a floor-to-ceiling bookcase partially filled with books was all she needed. On the table was a writing tablet and pens. There was also a green book with the gold words Western Diary. Alice tapped the book with her finger. Neither Ethan nor I knew if you are one of those people who like to keep a diary. I don't do it, but we have a sister Jane who does so diligently. There's three of us in the family. Jane has charted almost everything that has ever happened to us. Ethan and I thought, if you were like Jane, we'd provide a diary for you. You do have a lot to record, Savannah. I haven't kept a diary before this, but I will start. She couldn't wipe the smile off her face. As you said, I've got a few things to jot down. If you would like to bed down now, that's fine. If you don't, I can pour you a pot of Alice's honey tea that will relax you and help you sleep. Savannah sighed. That might be nice. I've been on the go all day, but a cup of tea and a bit of rest might be just the thing before I go to bed. Okay, come on out to the kitchen. Alice snuffed the lantern and motioned for Savannah to follow her. For a second, Savannah thought she'd surely fallen asleep and was dreaming, although Ethan seemed to have his moody moments and fell quiet sometimes. Savannah could tell that he was a hard-working and responsible man. He was also so much more handsome than she ever imagined. But why doesn't he marry someone from town? Five minutes later, Savannah sat in a kitchen chair, sipping tea from a porcelain cup. Been a lot to take in, hasn't it? Alice said. Yes, it has, but you being here is the perfect end to a very exciting day. I will remember this day for the rest of my life. Things will get better, too, Alice said, patting her new friend's hand. My brother is not the most talkative man in the West, but I should warn you, there's a whole lot of men in the West who can't carry a conversation, except Dr. Fitz. Dr. Fitz is known for chatting his patient's ears off. His bedside manner can drive you up the wall at times. Don't get me wrong, he's a good doctor, and he's delivered half the folks in Easter Springs. He is the nicest gentleman on the face of the earth. But he does like to run on a bit, if you know what I mean. I think I do, Savannah said. But most men in the West are not that way. If you get two words out of them in an evening, that's amazing. Ethan is like that. He says what is necessary and not much more. He's very practical-minded. I did get him to talk a little over dinner. Probably about the ranch and surrounding views. He can say a few words about the bar W. Alice took a sip of her tea before adding, But I'm sure in no time he will be talking about you. And I hope you'll be saying a few good words about the Bar W and Ethan. I'm sure I will. She sipped the tea, feeling bone tired. Thank you for coming, Alice. It was a wonderful gesture.
Chapter 8 It was nine in the morning before Savannah woke up. She dressed hastily and walked out of bedroom. To her surprise, Alice sat in the living room drinking a cup of coffee. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning. What are you doing here, Alice? I'm glad to see you, but I didn't expect you today. I decided to say hello on your second day here, too. Both Ethan and I expected you to sleep late, knowing all that you went through yesterday, and I wanted to cook you a good breakfast. Of course, being on a ranch, you won't get to sleep late many days, but we wanted to give you at least one. After breakfast, go out to the barn, and Ethan will show you the horses and you can ride around the ranch. For now, just sit down and get oriented. She eased down on the sofa while Alice headed for the kitchen. Within a few minutes, Savannah heard the sizzle of bacon frying. Growing a bit impatient, Savannah moved from the sofa to a window and peered out. A large red barn was a short ways from the house. Two corrals could be seen near the barn. In one, two horses roamed around slowly. A trail led from the corrals down an incline to a green pasture. She walked over to the other side of the house and peered through a window. The green pasture curved around the house. You can't see all of the place from the house, Alice said from behind her. The pasture curves around in the back. We have a few nice little clumps of trees and greenery. If you like to ride, this ranch is a good place for it. About two miles west is where the cattle roam. They can usually be left alone except for branding and roundup time. Do you ever have any trouble out here from other ranchers? She said, thinking about the dime novels. Occasionally, Alice moved to the window to look outside with her. At times, we've lost some stock, but it hasn't been bad this year. Ethan has an agreement with a few of the smaller farms. County had bad times four years ago, had a drought and then some bad storms. Some of the crops were devastated. Some neighbors went through hard times. Ethan told four or five of the small farmers, if they ever need a meal, just take one of our cattle and pay us back when they could. One beef can sustain a family for a good while. That helped a number of families make it through the year. That was a wonderful act. Ethan must be a very kind man, Savannah said. He is. I sometimes call him a silent saint. He has a very good heart. So now if we miss a beef occasionally, we figure a neighbor just needed dinner for his family. She laid her hand on Savannah's arm. Let me go check on breakfast real fast. Seconds later, she called. Okay, Savannah, come and get it. When she sat down at the table, her plate was brimming with scrambled eggs, bacon, potatoes, and bread. She grabbed a fork and stuck it into the yellow eggs. Did I hear last night that you encourage Ethan to put an ad in the matrimonial times? She asked. Sure did. Ethan needed a wife, he needed help with the ranch, and he needs companionship. He was acting more and more like a hermit, and usually hermits get grouchy and cranky. I didn't want that to happen to Ethan. I was hoping he'd get a good one, and he did. Savannah bit into a strip of bacon. She held up the slice. You're a great cook, Alice, and thank you for the compliment. Is Ethan out working now? I imagine he was up with the dawn. Yes, every day but Sunday. Sunday he goes to church. Had to urge him to attend at first. I not only wanted him to hear Reverend Tiller's sermon and gain some spiritual insight, I wanted him there just to get him out in public a bit so he could greet his fellow citizens. Church is about the only place he could carry on conversations with other people. For a long while, he's had one thing on his mind, this ranch. I don't think he should be so focused. Alice leaned against a kitchen table and crossed her arms. So, I would appreciate if you tell him to keep up his attendance. I think attending every Sunday has been good for him. 
It's the least I can do for my new friend, Savannah thought. Of course, Savannah assured her. I like to go, and I would definitely like to hear the town minister. Good, thank you. I told Ethan you two should chat with Reverend Terrell. He might have advice for newlyweds. Savannah sipped from the cup of coffee that Alice had placed before her. I hadn't really thought about that, but I guess it's not a bad idea. I guess a minister would know something about marriage. I'm sure he wouldn't mind if we asked for some counsel. How long have you been married, Alice? Almost four years now. Alfred and I get along fine. I think we were made for one another. He laughs a lot, and so do I. So we generally have a ball. What does he do? Savannah asked. He rides shotgun for Wells Fargo. That sounds a bit more dangerous than it is. In the three years he's been riding, there's been only one attempted robbery, and one of Alfred's shotgun blasts stopped that almost before it began. The bad thing is, he's on the road a lot. But he also gets along well with Ethan and told me to take all the time I need to help the mail-order brides settle in. That's real nice. As soon as you settle in, we'll have you two over for dinner, Alice said. Savannah finished the last of the potatoes and eggs and washed it down with the coffee. Thank you, Alice. Think I will mosey over to the barn now. I can't wait any longer to check out the horses. Why don't I come over tomorrow morning and we'll take a ride into town? I can introduce you to some folks. Thank you, I'd enjoy that. Savannah walked out the door and spied Ethan near the barn. She waved and he waved back. What is the proper procedure here, she wondered. Kiss the future husband on the cheek, shake hands, greet him warmly, probably the last. Ethan, you're looking fine today, she said as she walked over. Thank you, Savannah, so do you. Come on in, I'll show you the horses. Chapter 9 They walked into the barn, and Savannah gasped when she spied a golden-haired mare munching on hay. She walked up slowly and ran her hands along the horse's back. That's Daisy, Ethan said. She's two years old and can run like the wind, a very fine mount. Hello, Daisy, Savannah said. She moved and patted Daisy's face and neck. I have a hunch we are going to be great friends. The horse nudged her, then appeared to nod. I have a feeling you can understand me, girl. Maybe not the words, but you understand what I am saying. You are so beautiful. Daisy nodded again. Ethan watched both beauties and grinned. The horse really did seem to be responding to Savannah. She ran her hands over the horse's golden body. You appear to be in fine shape. She patted her again. Maybe a tad overweight, girl. Ethan chuckled. She is. She hasn't had anyone to ride her, so she's just been relaxing and eating. Regular exercise would really help her. She'll get that. Mind if I saddle her now and ride her? Not at all. I'll saddle up, too, and we'll ride around the ranch. Savannah quickly saddled Daisy and led her out of the barn and into the sunlight. The horse seemed comfortable with the saddle. She stuck her boot in the stirrup and hauled herself up on the horse's back. Ethan had also finished saddling his horse, a black and white stallion, and lifted himself on the horse's back. He spurred the horse, turned him left, and headed toward the pasture. They rode silently. She smiled at him, and Ethan smiled back. He heard her sigh and knew she'd picked up on his aloofness. It's not that he wanted to distance himself from her, but he had to be sure that his life was secure, that the ranch was secure. He knew she wanted affection, like most women, but that would come with time. Who wouldn't want to give her affection? He had seen how some of the men looked at her when they were eating dinner after her journey. The pasture branched out between a wedge of trees. 
Ethan led the horse near the rippling brook. Savannah was looking everywhere, her head whipping around and taking in the elms and yellow aspens which guarded the trail. He silently let her soak in the tranquility. Like him, he could tell she found peace in the sound of the rippling brook, the slight breeze stirring the yellow flowers, and the confidence she appeared to have with Daisy. A squirrel chirped and ran into the path, circling Daisy's legs. Ethan watched from his peripheral vision, but he trusted Daisy. The horse ignored the squirrel completely. Savannah giggled and hugged Daisy's neck. Many horses would have bolted. That didn't spook you, though. Daisy just trotted on. Savannah sat upright, and Ethan felt her eyes on him. Did you say your father owned this ranch once and you inherited it? She asked. Yes, my father bought this place more than 50 years ago. He built it bit by bit. It was much smaller when he purchased it, but over the years, he added to it, buying land here and there and building it up. Now, the Bar W is one of the biggest ranches in the region. I need three men to help me with all the work. You've done a good job. I know it can't be easy to run a ranch. No, ma'am, Ethan shook his head. It's not. There's always a hundred things to do and little time to get them done. There were many days I rose before the sun was up and went to bed long after it had set. But the result was worth it. I can tell it was. A man likes to own something and to know it's his and it can't be taken away. We're building for the future, he said pointedly. Would she pick up on it? Savannah simply nodded. There's an Old Testament line. Everyone will sit under their own vine and their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken, he said. That's always been one of my favorite lines of scripture. It's a beautiful line, she smiled. That reminds me, your sister asked me to keep you going to church every Sunday. I said I would try. He laughed. Alice likes to push people to do what she thinks they should do. But I admit she was right about church. I have enjoyed going. Good. Then let's attend Sunday. Reverend Terrell starts the service at 1030. So we need to leave about 930 to get there on time. By the way, do you sing? The parson is always looking for singers for the choir? Well, I guess I'm passable. I can carry a tune. That's good enough for the reverend, Ethan said, and nodded, thinking that going to church would be a fine move. That would also be a good place for you to meet some folks. We can say hello to many people before and after services. I'm sure everyone around here would like to meet you. You can introduce me to your friends, Savannah said. In my opinion, you're not counting friends anymore when you count past the fingers of one hand. That makes sense. She agreed, then admitted, I was afraid your family might treat me differently because I'm from the East. But now, I'm looking forward to having Alice as a true friend. Alice is a good woman, and she'll make a great friend for you. The horses continued on at a slow gait as he continued. Along with her, a friend of mine by the name of Dan Evers and his wife encouraged me to get a mail-order bride. His wife's name is Belle. Where do they live? She asked him. Their ranch, the Circle T, is on the north side of town, he explained. Dan also runs cattle, and over the past eight years, he built his ranch up nicely. Do they attend church? They should be at the service. They not only enjoy the pastor's sermons, they are friends of his, and Dan is a deacon. The pastor married and counseled them during the first few months of their marriage. Really? He could almost see more questions in her mind. Yes, both Dan and Belle are strong. I should say headstrong. Don't get me wrong, they are good people, but once in a while they can bump heads, he explained. Once or twice during the early days of their marriage, 
the Reverend was a peacemaker and a very good one. Dan has stood with me a few times in the past, and he was there when we helped the sheriff find and capture the Merrick brothers. The Merrick brothers? Yep, two no-accounts who drifted into town and stayed a few years ago. Then they tried to hold up the Wells Fargo office. Didn't get away with much, but injured the clerk. The sheriff got a posse and headed after them. We caught up with them in about three days. The sheriff told them to surrender. They pulled their guns and shot at us. I'm glad you weren't hurt. She gazed at him with wide eyes. No. To be honest, they were lousy outlaws. They should have surrendered. As it was, one was killed and the other brother was wounded. He went to prison for a couple of years, then was released. No one has heard from him since he got out. Have many robberies here, Ethan? She asked, growing a little pale. He shook his head. No, the town is basically peaceful. Are they your only friends? No, I have another one named Dale Humphrey. He's vice president of the Easter Springs Bank. He tells me a banker has better hours than a rancher, and I agree with him. He goes in at eight and leaves at five. There's been many days when I was working long before eight and didn't stop working until long after five. But I don't envy him or his desk job. I like the open country. Savannah nodded. I like it too. I think the Aspens are absolutely beautiful. The path they were riding swerved north. They turned their horses. The thin aspens had sprouted with their yellow leaves, giving the woods a colorful allure. To be honest, I really haven't paid much attention to them, but they are nice. Now that you mention it. He looked from the trees to Savannah. He had heard nothing to alarm him, but he couldn't claim he'd heard nothing to allay his fears. He had never trusted anyone besides a family member but Savannah seemed like a good soul. Savannah sighed and patted her horse. He could tell that she liked the animal. Even the short time she had been on Daisy, the animal seemed to be comfortable with her. Ethan lapsed into silence again, but she started talking. There was a couple back in my hometown, Thelma and Roy Myers, who had been married almost 35 years. I visited them a lot, she said. I was amazed that they could sit on their porch or in a living room, just smiling and not saying a word. I don't remember feeling any tension in their home. She stopped talking, and a thoughtful expression crossed her face before she continued. I had also walked into the house twice of a family named Corrigan in Millersville. The father, Deke Corrigan, was a mean man, and his three sons weren't much better. I went to the house to take care of Molly Corrigan, Deke's wife, when she had fallen sick. The house was so tense, almost hostile. When Molly recovered and was back on her feet, I was deeply thankful to leave and never go back to the house. A rabbit scampered along the trail, twisting around the trees. Savannah jumped, her hand flying to her chest, then laughed and said, Cute little things scare the wits out of me. We have many small and large creatures everywhere around here, Ethan said. But some of them are not nearly as cute as that rabbit. You have to respect the panthers, other wildcats, and bears. They were here before the humans. He looked over to see her smiling at him. I guess we are encroaching on their territory. They obey the law of the wild. She touched an aspen flower as the horses trotted by a group of trees. These are so lovely. Seeing her admiration of nature, he reminded himself that they had to get to know each other. Pushing his cautious side down, he asked himself, What would Alice say right now? Savannah, you can do what you want with the house in terms of decorations and things like that. I see how much you like these. You can collect some and put flower pots in different rooms if you like. Thank you, Ethan. Maybe I will add a few colors to the house. 
To be honest, and I don't mean to complain, the inside looks a little bit drab. Ethan nodded. You're right about that. That's not one of my talents. My father said once, a man can build a house, but it takes a woman's touch to make that house a home. So you can make it any way you want to. I will do that. Appreciation showed in her gaze. You can expect the house, or rather our home now, to be a little more colorful in the future. A squirrel chattered and leaped from one tree to another. A second one followed. Savannah looked up at the sky as a red-tailed hawk circled lazily overhead. Those squirrels better watch out, she said. Yes, the hawks are swift. They can swoop down quickly, and that squirrel will be breakfast in no time. The animals are graceful, but it's kill or be killed in the wilderness. To survive, an animal has to kill another to live. Savannah simply nodded. She didn't appear to pale over a talk of survival of the fittest, nor did her interest in her surroundings dim. He'd heard that women didn't like their husbands drinking, but Savannah hadn't balked at that. How would she react to a poker game every now and then? He put off asking her, for now. The parson has given one or two sermons on it. He said it's a fallen world, so that's the way it is in the animal kingdom, but it should not be like that with humans. We should care for another, Ethan said. Can't argue with that. Sounds like a good sermon. Do you remember other things he said that day? Just that an animal has a path he can't leave. It's his basic nature. He seeks food and kills when he need to, not because he's bad or evil, but that's their path of life since the fall of man. But men and women have a choice not to act wild. The Lord said in the Old Testament, I set before you good and evil, blessings and curses, life and death. Therefore, choose life. The pastor said, men are able to choose, so choose good, not evil. Have to agree with him on that, too, Savannah said. He knew the time had arrived to ask about poker and shifted uneasily in the saddle. Chapter 10 Ethan looked around as if seeking some place of refuge. Does he expect me to be more gentle, like other women? Savannah thought. I need to tell you something, too. Something that has become a hobby of mine, Ethan said. I wonder what you do on those few hours of the week when you're not working, she encouraged. I picked up the poker habit from Dan a few years ago. I had told him he had to do something to liven up those dull hours in his bank office. At first, he just laughed. But Dan and I and a few other men have a weekly poker session from time to time. We hold it at different places, but at times it's at our house. He rushed on like he expected her to forbid it. I know some women don't like poker, so I... I'm fine with poker, she said, smiling at the memories of Mr. Holliday's lessons. I'm not an experienced player, and I don't mean to shock you, but... Do you all allow a woman to play? I know the rules, but I've never actually played the game. I wouldn't mind trying my luck with cards. For a moment, Ethan stared at her with his jaw hanging slack. Then slowly, a smile crept across his face. I guess we can do that, he chuckled. I wonder how the boys will react to a woman joining us. If they lose, they'd probably be mightily ashamed. Your friends will probably think they can't lose against a woman at a poker table. Maybe I can show them otherwise. Ever since I learned the rules, I wanted to play. This will be fun. She was delighted when he outright laughed. An arched brow, amused gleam in his eyes, or a tiny chuckle was most appreciated. But she'd held back hope for making this handsome man laugh. That simple response, in her eyes, packed a huge wallop. If they hadn't been on horseback, she would have reached out for a physical connection. Just a simple hand over his, of course. 
Instead, she promised, for my admission to the game, I'll cook something for when everyone needs a break. When is the next game? This Monday, just two days from now, with everyone so busy, we try to play once a month. She was thrilled that the game was so soon. And who's coming to play? Dale, of course. He has become passionate about the game. He has even been to a few poker tournaments down in Denver. I heard he cornered a gambler down in Denver once and spent about three hours listening to the guy give him tips that vastly improved his game. He'll be bringing a friend to the next game. John Devers, a local livery stable owner, will be here too. A man who cares for horses. That's nice. Who else? Major Luke Whittier, also known as Major, because he was a major during the Civil War. At first, he wasn't well liked around here, but he won us over. Why wasn't he liked? She asked. He was a Confederate major, originally from Tennessee. So some took their bitter feelings out on him. Since he arrived, though, more Confederates ventured to Colorado, and any bitterness died out. He lives about 10 miles from the Bar W and grows corn and hay. Beat his sword into a plowshare, did he? For a moment, Ethan looked surprised. Yes, and he's become a very good farmer. Some of the best corn in the nation is grown in Colorado. You must know the scriptures well, Savannah. I've read the Bible a lot, even some of those Old Testament scriptures that many people don't read. She quoted a couple of verses and caught him glancing her way. I'm sorry for going on, Ethan. To be truthful, I didn't have many friends in Georgia. When I find an audience, I tend to talk more. That's all right. I think you're one of the few people who Reverend Terrell will enjoy conversing with. Savannah chuckled. I might be able to do that. Anyway, who's the other possible poker player? Ben Hardgrove. Ben is a former Union soldier who runs the general store now. Whatever you want, he can get for you. So, he and the Confederate Major are okay being around each other? She asked, unable to imagine opposites of that caliber competing at poker. They've become good friends, he assured her. We should have an entertaining game then, Savannah said, wondering all over again how war-roughened soldiers from opposite sides would respond to her being added to the mix. She turned Daisy as the path swerved right and steered the conversation onto another path. This is a beautiful ranch. Thank you. As I've said, I've tried my best to build it up. You succeeded. At a loss for anything more to say, and yearning to test Daisy, she pulled the reins and halted the horse. A long stretch of empty land faced her. I think I'd like to see how fast Daisy can run. You don't mind, do you? No, she'll probably like it. Go as fast as you want. But let me ask you something first. Sure. Savannah shifted in the saddle to prepare for a faster gait. I saw that long brown bag or sack you had with your luggage. I've never seen anything like it. What is that? Oh, it's the bag for my bow, and the round bag is my quiver full of arrows. Ethan's eyes widened, and his mouth formed an O before asking, Bow? Arrows? You aren't half Indian, are you? Savannah laughed while shaking her head. No. Not at all, but I do know how to shoot an arrow. I practiced archery back in Georgia and got pretty good at it. I can show you later if you like. Yes, I'd like to see you in action. She appreciated his sincerity and how he didn't shift his gaze from hers. But how did you learn to shoot a bow? There was a gentleman in my hometown who was good at it. He was a friend of my father and noticed that I was curious, so he taught me. I tended to pick up solitary hobbies since I was a little rougher than most of the ladies back in Millersville. With that being said, I wasn't a good match for any of the young men either. 
Since they had covered the more unladylike qualities, Savannah rushed on. They wanted more genteel ladies who liked to sew and whatnot, but I think my father wanted a son, so he raised me in that fashion. Holding her breath, she waited for a moment while he silently studied her. Then he slowly nodded his head as understanding crept into his gray eyes. Riding and shooting, Colorado is a good place for it. His head tipped in a nod toward her as he added, and a good place for poker. She released the air from her lungs and relaxed again. She couldn't imagine being sent away from his ranch, rejected because she didn't even fit into Western territory. Besides, she'd fallen a little in love with this region and his ranch. May I? She asked him politely, shifting further into a position more befitting a speedy ride. He nodded once and swept a hand in front of him. Excitement tingled in her belly as she leaned forward in the saddle while squeezing in with her knees. Daisy responded to her as if they'd ridden every day. Laughter poured out of her as the wind's drag pulled on her clothing and her hair. She turned Daisy easily and kept in the saddle when some riders might have fallen. The horse moved like the wind in a Georgia storm, fluidly and gracefully responding to every one of Savannah's prompts. About a mile later, she eased Daisy to a halt and patted her. She glanced backward at the sound of thundering hoofbeats. Ethan was riding fast and diminishing the distance between them. If every day was this exhilarating, Savannah knew she'd do just fine. We're going to go on many more rides, Daisy, she said, patting her again. She was still concerned with Ethan's suspicious looks, but this outing was reassuring. What could she do other than asking him outright about his worries to make him less suspicious? Taking a deep breath, she reminded herself that they were still strangers getting to know one another and to take things slow. Every time I look his way now, I feel all warm and fuzzy. Does he feel that way too? Chapter 11 She had just left the barn with the bucket full of dirty water, which gave Ethan a moment of alone time to reflect. He'd been amazed at her ability atop Daisy. Three days ago, rider and horse had come together as if they were long-lost friends. Out of the corner of his eye, he watched her return to his brown and white stallion stall and hang the bucket full of fresh water on a nail. His stallion, Courage, raised its head, but instead of drinking the water, he nudged Savannah's head. She reached up and stroked his neck, whispering something that Ethan couldn't hear. Ethan paused in midstep and reveled over how easily she had won his horses over, especially Courage. That horse had nipped everyone who had gotten within range of his teeth. His amazement wasn't just at Courage's response to her, either. She'd cleaned the water trough, then worked on their stalls, laid fresh hay, and dumped out the dirty water from where Ethan had brushed them down. She had to be worn out and covered in grime, but she hadn't complained one bit. His suspicions were quickly turning to admiration. She'd proven in just one day that she was made of tougher stock than most women he'd heard about. He'd noticed her nervousness when she'd admitted her lack of the more genteel traits of Southern ladies. Now, her reason for heading to the West made more sense. He couldn't imagine that she was dishonest. Then again, how many women held her fascination with learning how to play poker. He'd bet that number was almost non-existent. He listened to her whispery voice as she gave each of his horses attention. The promise to ride and feed them treats made him smile. She certainly loved horses. Reuben, a chestnut gelding, snorted and eyed Ethan, as if saying, it's about time you brought us a caring female. Reuben was a large, gentle horse, but a lazy one, too. He'd have to urge Savannah to ride him and work some of the laziness off him. 
He had just moved out of Reuben's stall when a tired sigh caught his attention. Savannah, her back to him, was leaning against a younger horse's stall. As he watched, she pushed off and slowly went inside. He quietly moved to where she'd been leaning and watched her through the slatted boards. Red Johnny was more energetic, being three years old, than his other horses. He had faith that Savannah was safe around him, but Ethan couldn't claim relaxation just yet. As with the others, she whispered as she moved up the side of the stall. Red Johnny was irritable today. Ethan had noticed his mood earlier, but he seemed worse. Ethan started to call out to Savannah when she picked up on the horse's distress. Are you all right, boy? She asked. Reaching out slowly lay her hand on him. Red Johnny shifted to the side, whinnying in a way that told Ethan that something wasn't right. Although Savannah had only visited the young horse maybe a total of four times over the past three days, she soothed. Oh, something's off, isn't it? Ethan's heart almost stopped when she stepped closer and ran her hand down Red Johnny's side. Let's see what's going on. As she continued to talk with a soothing tone, Ethan tracked her hand as it ran part of the way down one leg. Red Johnny stepped to the side and Savannah breathed. Aha. Okay, boy, careful now, she soothed as rubbed the bridge of his nose. She stepped around to his other side, disappearing from Ethan's view. He saw her hand wrap around the young horse's left leg. Ethan was afraid. If he stepped forward now, he'd spook the horse. Incredibly, the horse responded and lifted its hoof. Savannah's finger explored the bottom before stopping to work at something. You have a stone lodged in your hoof. There we go, she soothed. That should do it. You should feel better now. You will soon be back to your rambunctious self. She placed the hoof down and stood up, adding, Have to be careful there, fellow. I imagine there are a great many pebbles out here. We have to keep you in good shape. Ethan relaxed, jaw sagging, and the breath rushed out of him. Savannah turned her head and caught him peeking through the boards. She grinned just as thunder rolled overhead. Earlier that day, Ethan had warned of the right conditions for a storm. If she wasn't with him, he might have stripped his clothes off and taken advantage of the cool rain. He urged her out of the stall and they rushed toward the house. Just inside the door, she said, After the storm, I'll get the other three stalls cleaned. They can wait, he told her. You've done the work of two men today. He pointed to the dining room table and said, Sit, I'll be right back. Moments later, he returned with a glass of red wine. Here you go, Savannah. Thank you, Ethan but I would have gotten it. He sat down in the chair next to hers and shook his head. No, I've never seen those stalls look so fine. Of course, they will be dirtied up again tomorrow, but for a few hours, they'll shine. She sipped her wine, appearing deep in thought for a bit, then said, I found a small pebble in Red Johnny's hoof. I popped it out. Thank you. He didn't want to let her know that he'd been gawking at her. We always have to watch for those. Glad you were so alert. Is the cattle in good shape? Yes, cattle are contentious animals. They can get spooked easily and stampede. That's why we sing to them. Really? Then that is true, she laughed. Think I read that in the dime novels. Cowhands singing to the cows. I wondered if it was true. He sipped his drink and nodded. Oh, it is. The cattle are not too bad here on the ranch. They're used to the land here, but on trail drives, they're much easier to spook. That way songs seem to soothe them. You can have, say, a hundred beef cattle with hooves and horns galloping towards you in a fury that can't be stopped. The noise is deafening. The ground shakes and you think it might split in two. 
He took another drink and looked over at her. Same goes with horses. If you get 50 of them running wild, you don't want to be in their way. They will run you over and pound you into the ground. There's not enough left of you to bury. When my father was alive, he lost some men that way. Buried them right here on the ranch. Is your father buried here too, Ethan? He nodded. Yes. There's a cemetery in town, but my father wanted to be buried here, where he had lived the last 50 years of his life. There's a little meadow about a mile from the house with oak and aspen trees. It's on a slight hill where you can see down into the pasture. My father always loved that spot and told us he wanted to be buried there. That's where we had the ceremony. I'd like to be buried there too, beside him and my family if they so choose. Seems like a good place, Savannah said, taking another sip of the wine. Two days later, Ethan and Savannah were sitting on the front porch and watching the sunset when he said, You do want children, don't you, Savannah? I think most women do. Yes, I do, she said. Even though my sisters and I were not the closest siblings in the South, I definitely want children running in and out and playing in the yard. Ethan nodded. I guess I should have asked you that before. But as I said, I figured most women do. Guess, in the days to come, we will be learning a great deal about each other. She gave a quick smile. By the way, I don't have any nasty surprises in my background, besides the fact I scandalized my Georgia hometown with my shooting and riding. That won't scandalize people here. Twenty years ago, we had some Indian battles. Warring tribes and renegades swept the region a time or two. We wanted everyone, men or women, to be able to shoot a gun and blast an Indian or outlaw off his horse. Back then, it was difficult to find a woman who didn't shoot a gun. He looked over at her. I saw you riding. So do you shoot as good as you ride? Better, Savannah said. Guess that's the correct answer, Ethan said. And I'm sure it's true. Chapter 12 On Sunday, the buggy ride to the church went smoothly, if, for the most part, silently. Ethan was back in a somewhat stoic mode. It was almost as if he had a low quota of words every day or week, and if he went over the quota one day, he had to say fewer words the next day. Ethan tied the horses to one of the hitching posts at the church. Both men and women walked up the steps to the front door. Reverend Terrell greeted all the congregants. Like the sun on a summer day, he beamed friendliness on the crowd. Savannah caught some of the conversation. The pastor knew every member of every family, as well as what they were doing and the state of their health. She waved hello to Alice and saw her husband for the first time. He was a large man, at last six two, with a bull chest and wide smile. She offered her hand, fearing his large, knurled fingers would crush it, but his shake was very gentle. It's wonderful to meet you, Alfred, she said. Call me Al, ma'am, he said. Alice has been such a wonderful help to me since I arrived. She's a wonderful lady. That she is. She's been a wonderful help to me, too. The best thing I've done in life is marry her. It's wonderful to have a husband who brags on you, Alice said, grinning wider with every word. Alfred moved a step to the right and shook hands with Ethan. The two chatted for a minute and Alice leaned closer to lower her voice. How is everything, Savannah? she asked. Fine. I think, I think things are moving along. Ethan seems to be a fine man. She lowered her voice to a whisper. Don't think he's quite comfortable with me yet, but... Alice patted her hand. It will come. I'm glad you're here. There's a lot of people you need to meet. She turned around, smiled, and pointed to a mustached man with a badge on his chest. And here is one of them right now. This is Sheriff Don Meadows. Sheriff, meet Savannah Walton. Sheriff Meadows tipped his hat. 
Good to meet you, ma'am. Glad to have you in Easter Springs. It's a beautiful town, Sheriff. I like it very much. I'm so happy all those dime novels I read back in the East weren't true. It's actually very peaceful here in the West. Meadows gave a sigh of aggravation and shook his head. If those so-called writers ever come out here, I'll arrest them. Those silly books are just one lie after another. I've fired my gun as a part of my duties three times in the past two years. You can be sure we have a peaceful town because we have good, law-abiding people here. Them dime novels would have us shooting everybody in sight. We are a friendly town full of people who, he pointed toward the church, are God-fearing people who will help others. It's a reputation we're happy to have. I sense that, Savannah assured him. I sure do. We should go in, Savannah, Ethan said. He escorted her into the church, which was almost full. Only a few seats lay empty in the pews. The Reverend Terrell strode to the lectern. He doesn't stay up there, Ethan whispered to her. He likes to come down and stand before the congregation. He doesn't like that high position. Reverend Terrell raised his hands as if welcoming the congregation. Thank you very much for coming this morning. You do honor to the Lord and honor to me to get up and come to God's house instead of sleeping in. And I know the flesh wanted to sleep in. Murmurs of laughter came from the congregation. Before we began, let us pray. Would you bow your heads, please? He waited until every head was bowed. Father, I ask your blessings upon your people who came out to serve you today and blessings upon this town. You have blessed us with good weather this year. Three months ago, when it looked like a drought was near, we came together in this place and prayed for rain. Two days later, we had a gully washer, which proves the abundance of God. We didn't just get just enough rain. We had some extra and our crops prospered. We thank you for your provision. Now, I ask your anointing to be on the message today. If any member of this church is struggling with a problem and is unsure what to do, may he receive revelation during the sermon and may you show him the answer in Jesus' name. Amen. A chorus of amens were repeated by the congregation. Reverend Terrell opened his Bible. This morning, I would like to talk to you uh, about chapter in the Old Testament, which may have particular relevance today, seeing that we have a newcomer. Several people shot welcoming glances and smiles in Savannah and Ethan's direction. The chapter of Ruth. The pastor continued. At that time, Naomi and her husband went to live in the region of the Moabites. Naomi had two sons, and they both married Moabite women. Later, Naomi's husband died, and her two sons died. Naomi planned to return to her home. She heard the Lord had come to the aid of his people. Reverend Terrell walked out from behind the pulpit and stood before the crowd. Now aren't those precious words. The Lord has come to the aid of his people. Well, Naomi wanted to be back in her homeland. We all should be in a place where God is blessing his people. But she told her two daughters-in-law to stay with their people in Moab. Ruth said no and said a line that has been repeated through the ages. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. The pastor paced to the left a few steps as his voice rose. This showed great faith, not only in Naomi, but in the Lord. Ruth said, I'm going to trust your God. Some Christians nowadays won't even say that. Ruth, out of trust, is going to an alien land. She doesn't even know if people are going to like her over there, but she trusted Naomi's God. Reverend Terrell paced back to the right of the congregation. He raised a finger and pointed it toward the men and women. 
When you trust God, he will bless you as he blessed Ruth and Naomi. I say the story may have particular relevance today because in this time in the West, we have mail order brides. One joins us in the congregation today. Just as Naomi went to a foreign land, the land of the Moabites, Savannah here, his hand swept toward her, has had to arrive in a foreign land. When you're from South Georgia, as she is, I'm sure Colorado must appear like a very foreign land, especially if you've been assured by all the dime novels that it's a violent and deadly place. He smiled as laughter spread through the crowd. But let me say to Savannah that the Lord will bless you and this town and this congregation will bless you. The Moabites did not follow God. They had their own gods, but they didn't follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But even if his people wander off, God will bless his people if they are right in their hearts. And we do follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So we are going to be blessed, and in turn, we will be a blessing to Savannah and people like her. Entering a new land, whether Moab or Easter Springs, where you know that no one can obviously cause fear, you are a stranger in a strange land. But because we are followers of the Lord, there is nothing to fear here. We spread God's blessings around. We don't believe in fear. We believe in love and helping our neighbor. An amen came from the back of the church. Thank you, brother, Reverend Terrell said. With the Lord and his people here, Easter Springs should always be a place of hope, love, and goodness. So let us rededicate ourselves today. Being out in the world can wear you down sometimes. So I urge that we all, the pastor included, rededicate ourselves to the truth of the gospel and the word of God and work in those precious word. If we do that, then at the end of our lives, we can say, as Ruth did, the Lord has truly blessed me. Perhaps there might be a lesson there, Ethan thought. The new lady in the region, Ruth, did destroy her family, but blessed the people around her. In fact, she made history and became a pivotal woman in the history of the Savior. The pastor was making a deeper point than he realized. Ethan nodded. Perhaps he should give Savannah and this marriage closer attention. Maybe he was being a little too protective of the land, seeing problems and dangers when there weren't any. He had his guard up. Reverend Terrell's sermon was a message to let his guard down, at least some. If he kept high caution up, he would destroy the marriage before it began. Savannah was basically in the same position as Ruth. She was saying, your land will be my land, your God will be my God. He sighed and looked at Savannah. A very good sermon, he said. Yes, it was. With a grin, he realized the pastor had prayed for revelation for church members. That prayer may well have come to pass. Chapter 13 Savannah sat the fried chicken in the large basket then put the sliced turkey on bread and cut the bread into halves. Her whistling drifted through the air in the kitchen. Several robins, perched on tree branch slightly above the kitchen window, joined her in song. She moved the sandwiches onto a large plate. Several bottles of whiskey stood on a small table in the kitchen. She had enjoyed the sermon about Ruth by Reverend Terrell. Savannah knew she was in a strange land, and some of the customs in Colorado involved poker. This was going to be the best poker night the gentleman had ever had. To her, poker had become symbolic of the new land, and she was going to master it. And it was almost time. The table in the living room had been washed and polished and had a new blue tablecloth on it. Six chairs had been set up and a half dozen decks of cards sat on the table. If there was a speck of dust in the house, Savannah didn't see it. 
She walked out to the table to give it yet another look. Everything looked satisfactory. She gave the room her South Georgia grin of approval. Ethan opened the front door and smiled at her. Our first guests are on their way. Dale and his gambler friend are coming down the road. So, Mr. Holiday is coming to the game? I thought this might be two penny ante for him, she said. Maybe he just likes to keep in practice. Besides, he could win a fair amount here, if he wins, that is. Did the major tell you he was coming? she asked. Yes, he will be here, as will John Devers. Ben sent his regrets, so there will just be five. Ethan stepped outside the house and waved at Dale Humphrey as he rode up with Mr. Holiday, the friend who had given him poker advice. The two climbed down from their horses and shook Ethan's hand. In the distance, they saw two other riders coming toward the house. Savannah escorted the first two guests to the table. Take any seat, gentlemen. I should tell you, there will be a woman playing with you tonight. Humphrey smiled. I'm not surprised. Brett told me he taught you the game. He has helped my game, too. We will have to see if the students are as good as the teacher tonight. I look forward to it, she said. May I get you two a drink before we begin playing? Not me, ma'am. Mr. Holliday said. I try to stay sober during a game, but if I lose, I may have a few drinks. Not that he loses all that often, Humphrey said, but I will take one, please. Take a seat, and I will bring you one. She pointed to the half-dozen decks of cards on the table. Perhaps you'd like to inspect the decks, Mr. Holliday. They've been bought recently and haven't been opened, so they should be fine. I'm sure they are, Mr. Holliday said. He tapped one deck with a finger. They now have the Brett Holliday stamp of approval. When Savannah returned and set a drink in front of Humphrey, Major Whittier and Devers walked in. They smiled and waved. The Major was a tall, erect man with a thin mustache. He took off his hat and hung it on a rack just inside the front door. Major, Mr. Devers, please come in. May I get you a drink? Savannah asked. Thank you, ma'am. I will take one, the Major said. I usually just sip one drink during the game. I'll take one, too, but unlike the Major, I may take two or three more during the evening, Devers said. She brought out two drinks and set them down before Devers and Whittier. You all don't mind if there's a woman playing today, do you? I met Mr. Holiday on the stagecoach out here, and he was kind enough to teach me poker. I would like to try a few games. It would be a nice introduction to the West. I don't mind who plays, ma'am, as long as he or she brings money, Dever said. I've known one or two women who were very skilled in the art of cards, and I do mean skilled. They did not cheat, but boy, they were good. The major sipped his drink. Are you thinking of Diamond Jane up in Newcastle, John? She loved cards, and the cards loved her. You could not beat that woman in poker, at least not often. But she was a friendly lady. You'd lose at her table, but you'd lose with a smile. I trust you'll do that here, Ethan said. Lose with a smile. I've done that, Mr. Holliday said, but I'd rather win with a smile. I will be sitting out for a while, Ethan said. I thought I'd be a gentleman and allow Savannah to play a few hands. It will also save you money, Ethan, Humphrey said. Savannah, your future husband has many wonderful traits and is as honest as the day is long, but is not skilled as a poker player. He could use some tips from Brett here, too, although he doesn't wager that much. He's a conservative player. I'm going to stop giving out advice. It may start costing me money, Mr. Holliday said. What are we playing tonight? Our usual game is five card draw. That's fine with me, Humphrey said. Does anyone want to change the game? All the players shook their heads. 
Gentlemen, when you want to take a break, I have sandwiches and chicken in the kitchen. Ethan tells me you usually go about an hour, then take a break. So, we will feed you tonight. You're a wonderful host, ma'am, Mr. Holiday said, and the best-looking host we've ever had. You're always very gracious, Mr. Holiday, Savannah said. I think we should let the lady deal first. I agree with Mr. Holiday, the major said. Savannah slipped a deck out of its package cut the cards, and shuffled. She cut the cards and plopped them in the center of the table. Would anyone like to cut? Not me, Mr. Holliday said. I'm confident this is the most honest deal I'll ever see. Chapter 14 As Savannah dealt the cards, Ethan eased down into a chair so he could keep watch on the game. As the players picked up their cards, he couldn't tell if they liked or disliked their cards. Savannah grinned as she picked up her five cards. Mr. Holliday wore a smile, too. His friend Humphrey wore more of a stoic expression, and it didn't change when he looked at his hand. The major kept his military hard features. Devers didn't show any emotion, either. I was told table stakes are $20, Savannah said. She had placed a stack of bills before her, most of it money that had been given to her by Mr. Holliday. She reached for the pile, grabbed a 20, and tossed it in the center of the table. So I will open. Three other players also tossed in a $20 bill. Mr. Holliday grinned and picked up two 20s. I'll call and I will raise 20, he said. Let's get things rolling. Mr. Holliday sat to Savannah's left, so it was her turn. She also picked up two 20s. I'll call and raise you 20, Mr. Holliday. It's to you, Mr. Humphrey. I see you two aren't wasting time, but I like to take things slowly and not jump into things, so I will sit this one out. He tossed down his cards. It's to you, Major, Savannah said. Let's see how deep the water is, he said, calling the bet. Devers also called. Ethan. Ethan had poured a drink and sat sipping from his glass. He focused his eyes on Savannah and, to a lesser degree, on Mr. Holliday. The gambler had an innate likability, but some men would have found his breezy, amiable nature irritating. Men were serious in the West. There was a town and state to build. There were serious times for serious men. Mr. Holliday's jokes would be like a spur in their shirts, pricking them. He shared some of that emotion. Building up his ranch, bequeathed to him by his father, was a serious task. His father had worked long hours to build a home and ranch from nothing. When his father came to Colorado, there were weeds, coyotes, and prairie dogs, and not much else. Now there was a civilization. His father had been a part of that civilization, and so was he. It was an achievement he was proud of. He had contributed to the town and the state, established law so women and children could live and prosper in peace and fulfill their dreams. He had a problem at times, putting that into words. He read poetry, but such lyrical words did not flow from his tongue. That was one reason other men like him would have looked with disdain at Mr. Holliday. He did not share in the work and toil on the land. He did not build. He made his living not from honest labor from the ground, but from a poker table. An honest living, since poker was legal, but not particularly honorable. Ethan admitted he enjoyed the game, as did many of his friends, but it was not how they made their living. Gambling contributed nothing to the land or the state, but Mr. Holliday had shown himself to be a good man, especially with his graciousness to Savannah. In fact, he had shown himself to be not just a good man, but an honorable man. That was not a phrase most people in the West would associate to a gambler, which just showed the variety of the region. Mr. Holliday kept grinning 
although he had lost a hand. Savannah grinned because she had won the deal. She reached toward the center of the table and drew the money to her. Thank you, gentlemen, she said. I'm sure you were just being kind to the lady by letting her win the first hand. I'll go along with that. It's easier than admitting I got outplayed, Devers said. You are being too generous, ma'am, Mr. Holliday said. As my papa said once, you can be kind every place in life except a poker table, son. When the cards are being dealt, you can't be kind, not unless you want to be broke, too. Your papa seemed to have talked a lot, Mr. Holliday. Yes, ma'am, he did. He liked to talk, he liked cards, and he liked good whiskey and had fondness for horses, too. Mr. Holliday took the deck when it was handed to him. It was his deal. He shuffled several times, then laid the deck on the table. Would anybody like to cut, he said. No, let's just concede Everybody around this table is honest, the major said. As Mr. Holliday dealt, Ethan gazed at Savannah. If he had to take a chance on a wife, and because he wanted children, he did want to be married, Savannah might be the right woman. If he made a wrong choice, he had a lot to lose. But maybe. Mr. Holliday dealt the cards, and the players chipped the $20 table stakes then looked diligently at their cards. The major dropped in an extra 40. I'm guessing the lady will not be able to take two hands in a row, so now is the time to strike, so to speak, he said. Great minds think alike, Humphrey said, also dropping two $20 bills in the pot. That means I don't have a great mind, the Devers said. He tossed his cards on the table. Savannah grabbed two 20s. Luck was with me the last hand. I think I should see if it's hanging around. Maybe it likes my company. Better be careful, ma'am. Luck has been known to be fickle, Mr. Holliday said as he grabbed some bills. But I will call the 40 and add 20. Are you bluffing, Mr. Holliday? Savannah said. No, ma'am, Mr. Holliday said, but I am betting. The other players called him. The major tossed two cards down. Holiday picked up the deck and tossed him two. Mr. Humphrey took two cards, too. Savannah stood with the pat hand. Miss Walton, are you bluffing now? Mr. Holiday said. A lady never tells, sir, Savannah replied. The dealer takes one card, Mr. Holiday said. He picked up the card, but his expression didn't change. I think it's to me, and I think I will bet 50. He smiled and placed a $50 bill in the center of the table. You look confident, Mr. Holliday, the major said. But you always look confident and sound confident. That's due to the pleasant surroundings and a good poker hand. I agree about the pleasant surrounding, but let's see about the alleged good poker hand. You calling, Major? I sure am. Humphrey looked at his cards, then shot a glance at Mr. Holliday and the Major. Gentlemen, I think I will call. Another fifty in the pot. It's to you, ma'am. Savannah put her cards face down on the table and looked around. I want to thank you, gentlemen, for complimenting the pleasant surroundings. I did want you to have a good time, and I'm glad you're enjoying yourselves. I noticed you have all called, but you haven't raised. Let's really make the game interesting. I will call 50 and raise 50. It's to you, Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday reached into his coat and brought out a cigar. He stuck it in his mouth and lit a match, bringing the flame to the tobacco. Oh, I'm sorry. Hope you don't mind smoking, ma'am. Not at all, he smiled. Even though Lady Luck may smile on a lady... I'm going to take a risk and call your 50. So it would be a hundred each to the other gentleman at the table. The major leaned back in his chair. Everybody's in? You can't all be bluffing. But how good a hand do you have? He tossed in another 50. 
going to find out. Humphrey raised his cards and took a long look at them. Well, when you play poker, you are faced with decision after decision. Bankers tend to be conservative. They like steady, secure investments. They usually don't like to take risks. I tend to play poker that way, too. Not sure how good a philosophy that is, Mr. Holliday said. If our host did not want to take risks, she would not be in Colorado, and we would have been deprived of her charming company. Humphrey smiled. How true. But Miss Walton is not in the banking business. But there are times when you have to take risks, Savannah said. There are times you need to play it safe, too. Guess we all need the wisdom to know when to take risks and when to keep safe. A lesson for us all, Mr. Holliday said. Ethan gave a slight nod. The major frowned. Well, on this particular decision, Mr. Humphrey, are you in or out? Are you going to play it safe and take a risk? Humphrey grabbed several bills and pushed them toward the pot. I'm taking a risk. Wouldn't do it with the bank's money, but I'll do it with mine. With a view like that, I'd like for you to handle my investments, the major said. Humphrey laughed. It's to you, Miss Walton, he said. As noted, I took a risk coming out here, and so far, it's paid off, so I guess I should keep taking risks. But at times, if you increase the risk, you increase the profit. So let's add to the pot. An extra 50 to you, Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday scratched his jaw. I'm curious, Miss Walton. I gave you two cards. You haven't looked at them yet. Ethan gasped. The gambler was right. Savannah had not looked at her two new cards. They still lay face down on the table. He swallowed and almost choked. He had never seen a player not look at his or her cards. You must have confidence in the three you have, or are you bluffing, Mr. Holliday said. Savannah's voice sounded as sweet as Southern tea. I have confidence in the dealer, Mr. Holliday. I just believe he'd give me good cards. Mr. Holliday shook his head. As my papa said, I'm not that kind, not at the poker table. If you call my bet, we'll find out. You were wasted in that small Georgia town, miss. You belong in the West. It's a land of creative thinking and bold action. I think you're bolder than most, Mr. Holliday said. I will take that as a compliment. Mr. Holliday shook his head. I have a feeling Lady Luck might be with the lady tonight, but even so, I have to call. I'll see your 50. Ethan edged forward in his chair. It was rare to have all but one player still in the game after a few raises. For four people to still be making bets was unusual. Did all four have strong hands? As he watched, the major called. The pot of money in the middle of the table had grown considerably. Humphrey called, too, as did Savannah. It's up to you, Mr. Holliday, but I don't think you will drop out. Call or raise, Savannah said. We'll call. Time to show cards, he said. Mr. Holliday spread his cards out on the table. Three sevens and two sixes. The major groaned and slapped down his cards. Humphrey dropped his jaw, then slowly dropped the cards from his hands. Three aces fell face up. Eyes turned to Savannah. She showed the three cards in her hand. Three kings. Slowly, she reached for her other two cards on the table. She pulled up one and laid it besides the kings. An eight of clubs. She reached for the second card and slapped the eight of hearts beside the eight of clubs. Full house, king high, she said. The four men sat and stared at her, mouths open, but no words came from their lips. For more than 30 seconds, they sat in stunned silence. Mr. Holliday wore a sardonic grin. Finally, the major spoke. If I had not seen that with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it, he said. 
I did see it with my own eyes, and I still don't believe it, Humphrey said. If the lady had dealt, I'd be tempted to say it was a stacked deck. But I know that's not true. I watched Mr. Holiday deal. It was straight. I've seen a few odd things in a poker game, but that takes the cake, the major said. Takes the case and takes the pot, for that matter. Savannah smiled. Gentlemen, at some times, you just have to take a chance. Or take a leap of faith, as the reverend might say. Mr. Holliday shook his head. As my papa might say, poker tables are not the place for miracles, but every once in a while, one happens. Think we should start calling you St. Savannah. Savannah clasped her hands together and looked around the table. Perhaps we should take a small break. You can refill your glasses and have some chicken and sandwiches, whichever you prefer. I need the drink first, the major said. I need a drink first, and I need a drink second, and possibly third. The men stood up and moved toward the kitchen. Ethan walked toward his future bride. Savannah, I've never seen anything like that. How did you do that? Ethan, I didn't do anything. I just picked up the cards. I was fully expecting to lose the hand to Mr. Holiday, and then suddenly, I won. How much did we win? I'm so flushed, I haven't counted it yet. It's easily a couple of hundred dollars. You have good friends, honey. They're not complaining when they lost. They're too shocked, as am I. Amazing. I keep telling you that every once in a while, you have to take a chance. He nodded. It does look like it. Think I might be able to take a chance on something else, too. She smiled, and her eyes gleamed. Glad to hear it. Let's talk about that after the game. The gentlemen may want a chance to get their money back. Let's see what they say after they eat. After they eat, Ethan said. They will still be speechless. Savannah. Ethan and Savannah walked outside where Mr. Holiday munched on a chicken leg. The major stood with him and chewed on a sandwich. The sun eased down behind the horizon, but a golden glow remained in the sky. Prettiest country in the world, Mr. Holliday said. In Wyoming, you have a lot of barren land, and the winds will scream and whip through those lands. Those howls of wind will hurt your ears. Even hermits will wish to see a town. Nebraska is the same way. Miles and miles and miles of empty land. But Colorado is scenic. It's a beautiful state. I agree, the major said. It's one reason I settled here. The winter isn't too bad. I've lived in Virginia back east, so I'm used to snow and ice. This isn't any worse than Virginia. Of course, Texas is home, so I travel back there every once in a while. The major swallowed the last bit of his sandwich. Let me ask you something, Mr. Holliday. You play poker a lot. Who was the best poker player you ever met? You mean, besides the lady we just played with? He shot Savannah a sideways glance. The major laughed. Yes, besides her. Well, I've played with many men who had a reputation, but I say the best one is a man named Cactus Jack Smith. A lot of players are flamboyant and like to attract attention to themselves. That's not Cactus Jack. He's a dapper man, dresses like a dandy, and wears a derby hat, but he's not flamboyant. He just eases down at a poker table and goes about his business, which is winning money at poker. Mr. Holliday nodded his head, and Savannah remembered, on the journey they'd shared, that he'd done the same when he was remembering something. He has a deep voice but is soft-spoken. He's about the best I've ever seen. He can make you think he's got aces full when he has nothing or make you believe he has nothing when he has a royal flush. He can read people, too. I can bluff almost every player, but not Cactus Jack. Maybe I've bluffed him one or two times, but that was it. The other times he could somehow read me. Mr. Holliday smiled. 
Cactus is a real nice guy. I hope to play him again sometime. I would rate him as the finest poker player in the West. If he's second to anyone, it's to this lady right here. The major laughed. That was the darndest thing I'd ever seen. I will remember that for the rest of my life. Savannah patted Ethan on the back, but looked toward Mr. Holiday and the major. Gentlemen, would you like to have another session before you go home? The major nodded. Ma'am, I sure would. Before tonight, the last time I was utterly astounded was back in 1862 during the war. I won't go into details, but what happened took my breath away. The second time I was astounded was tonight. I doubt I can be utterly astounded a third time, but let's have another session just in case. Mr. Holliday laughed and tipped his hat to Savannah. That teaching session, ma'am, turned out to be very expensive, but it was money well spent. You are gracious as always, Mr. Holliday. Perhaps with our next session you can win some of your money back. Perhaps. As Mr. Holliday walked back into the house, Ethan whispered in Savannah's ear, Tomorrow, let's go into town and you can spend some of the money you won. Buy a new dress or something. Sounds wonderful, she said. Chapter 15 Ethan halted the horses when the buckboard passed the general store in Easter Springs. The horses slowed and stopped. Have you met Hiram yet? he asked. No, Savannah said. Hiram Dollard is the owner of the store and he runs it with his wife, Nancy. I'll introduce you. Nancy will show you all the new dresses and everything else that's new in the store. You can spend the morning browsing around. I need to talk to Jarrett Crown. He's my attorney. It won't take long, though. I'll meet you back here. Ethan jumped out and tied the horses to the hitching pose. He walked in the store with Savannah and waved to the Dollards, who walked over to them. He introduced Savannah to the couple, Nancy Dollard, a chubby woman with wide eyes and a big smile looked delighted to meet her. I'll show you all the new dresses, dear, she said. But shouldn't I be showing you a wedding dress? Not quite yet. We're still at the introductory phase of the process. Oh, yes. Well, I know that will go smoothly. We've two or three mail-order brides here. The marriages have turned out fine. That's a good sign, Savannah said. So, we will hold the wedding dresses and show you the regular dresses, Nancy said. I'll be back in about 30 minutes, Ethan said. Savannah nodded. Come right over here, Savannah. We have all our dresses in this section of the store. Savannah saw a long line of dresses on a hanger. Most of the dresses were drab, she thought but a dress of blue caught her eye, as did a dark green one. She gazed at them. Take your time. We just had new ones delivered yesterday, but I haven't had a chance to unpack them yet. If you don't see anything you like, I'll go uncrate the new ones and you take a look at them. Thank you. Oh, I need some quills too. Would you have some here? Yes, I'll get some for you. Mrs. Dollard disappeared into the back. Savannah checked the dresses on the hangers. She smiled in approval over a white one and tried to decide how it would look on her. She wondered if the store had any necklaces, too. A necklace might be appropriate for a Sunday dress. And she wanted to hear Reverend Terrell's next sermon. She didn't notice a woman had walked up behind her. You must be Savannah, the mail-order bride I've been hearing about. The voice, not really holding a greeting note, surprised her. Savannah turned quickly. A redhead, with brown eyes and around her age, gazed at her. Yes, I'm Savannah, the mail-order bride of Ethan Waters. I haven't been in Easter Springs very long. I'm Evelyn Nodding. I certainly wish you the best. It must be very difficult to come from the East to marry a man you've never met. There have been a few challenges, 
Savannah said. Evelyn moved closer to her and lowered her voice. Has anyone in the community told you about Ethan? Puzzled by the question, Savannah shook her head. I don't know what you mean. Well, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but someone should. Ethan is single because he just enjoys playing the field. He romances a girl and even suggests marriage, but then pulls away and the poor lady is heartbroken. No, that can't be. Feeling her cheeks heat, Savannah shook her head again. Oh, but I'm afraid it is. He's done this to a number of girls in town. That's one reason he had to find a mail-order bride. He had run through the eligible young women in town. They all thought they would be his wife. But then, suddenly, he stopped coming around and looked for someone else. No, no, there must be some mistake. Savannah couldn't stop shaking her head. That's not Ethan. Oh, I'm so sorry, Evelyn said, patting Savannah's hand. It's what Ethan is known for. He becomes your friend, and then he breaks your heart. She looked up for a moment and sighed. You know, I really don't think it's meanness or cruelty in Ethan. I think he's just like some men, scared of commitment. Maybe he thinks he wants a wife, but then backs out at the last moment. I think he wants children because his late father wanted grandchildren to carry on the family name. But as I said... I don't think he's ready for a wife yet. He keeps backing out of that final step. He'll do that to you, too. For a moment, Savannah felt faint. She reached for the hanger and held on to it to steady herself and tried to breathe deeply. I'm so sorry to have to tell you this, but I know it's true. I'm one of the women it happened to. No, that just can't be true. But it is true. Ethan romanced me and made promises of marriage. He was really a charming man. It's said he doesn't talk a lot, and normally that's true. But he can wag his tongue when he needs to. Alice and Ethan, mentioning how quiet he could be along with witnessing it herself, ran through Savannah's mind. But Evelyn wasn't finished. I was completely taken with him, and I was even planning for a wedding. Then he just began criticizing me in every little thing. He found things wrong with the way I did things, what I liked, just angry over everything. I didn't know what to do. The woman huffed and shook her head, frowning and blinking quickly. Then he accused me of things I didn't do. I was so hurt by the way he was trying to find reasons to split us up. And he did. He just left with hardly a goodbye. I just hope I'm wrong and he doesn't do the same thing to you. But just in case, I had to warn you. That's terrible. Savannah stared at the woman's moist eyes. Just terrible. As I said, I don't think it's just meanness. After his father died, Ethan took over the ranch and worked night and day on it. It was all he did. I think it's twice as big now as when his father ran it. The woman shook her head, seeming awfully distressed even now. But he has always been a loner. Maybe that's the reason he has trouble with commitment. Maybe he's just so used to being alone that he can't change. I shouldn't have listened to all his sweet talk, but no one warned me. Savannah simply stared into space, fighting tears, as one thought roamed through her mind, what should I do? Evelyn patted her hand. But I do hope everything works out all right. Maybe he will change this time. But he's played this game so often. Well, I must go. Savannah said nothing as Evelyn walked away and out of the store. She shook her head. There was a certain reserve about Ethan that was recognizable from day one and that suspicion he carried. She thought that had been withering away, but maybe not. Was that suspicion what makes him not want to marry? And why did he send for a mail-order bride? There were a number of young women in Easter Springs, and Ethan didn't like any of them, or none of them liked him. 
She had never wondered about that before. She assumed there had not been many eligible women in Easter Springs. In the aftermath of the Civil War, there were few eligible men in many towns in the South. A lady in those towns did not have a lot of choices. She assumed men outnumbered women in Western towns, so men had to look other places for wives. But now that she couldn't stop thinking about it, Easter Springs was a good-sized town. There was not an abundance of women, but there didn't seem to be a scarcity either. And Ethan had to look other places for a bride? If what Evelyn said was true, See anything you like, dear? Nancy Dollard asked. Savannah shook her head, then said, Yes, yes, one or two caught my attention. Is something wrong, dear? You look and sound a bit winded. Yes, yes, everything is okay. I just need to catch my breath. Nancy, I just met an Evelyn. Evelyn, I'm sorry, for some reason her last name has slipped my mind. Nodding, Evelyn nodding. Her father is the school teacher here. Yes, nodding. Do you know her well? Savannah asked dreading the answer. Yes, her family has been here a couple of years. Both are fine people. She has a brother who is two years younger than her. She fancied Ethan for a while, and rumors flew about them seeing each other. But I don't think anything developed. Oh, really? Savannah's heart plummeted. Nancy smiled. I guess Ethan was picky, as he should have been. You have to make the right decision when you're choosing a wife or husband. And at that time, I don't think Ethan wanted to get married. At least, not yet. I know his sister Alice was prompting him to get hitched. But Ethan hadn't made his mind up yet. At least, I don't think so. Ethan has always liked steadiness. He's not real easy about change, even if the change might be good. And although I believe in marriage, it is a definite change. Doesn't come easy to some people. I guess you're right. Some people just don't like taking chances, do they? Not if it would change things, she shook her head. The West is not a land of guarantees. It's a land of promise. But many men have tried to build homes and businesses and went bust. This land can break you too and leave you with nothing. Men like Ethan and his father have understood that. They've seen good men try to build something and fail. Ethan's father was close to bankruptcy more than once, but he always managed to pull himself out of the hole, sometimes by the skin of his teeth. I didn't realize that, Savannah said. Oh, yes. Almost every rancher or farmer or businessman out here has experienced hard times. We've had some lean times here at the store, but we've always managed to make it. When you live like that, you don't like to take chances. Or rather, you don't like to take additional chances. You're taking a chance every day with your farm or ranch, a chance with the rain and storms or drought or bugs or Indians. And if you take too many chances, everything you own is ruined, so you have to be careful. Savannah nodded. I'm beginning to understand that. This part of the country is not like the East. There's a big difference. Men are different. Women, I guess, have to be different too. Nancy smiled. We get used to being stronger in the West. That's for sure. We sort of belong to the land now. It doesn't matter where we came from. We are part of the West now. She paused for a minute and lowered her voice. This land may be new to you, Savannah, but for those of us who have lived here for a while, it is our home. We wouldn't trade it for any other place in the world, but it is a land where, if you have the courage, you take chances, and at the same time you're afraid of them because you know how much is at risk. Kind of like a marriage to someone you don't know, I guess, Savannah said. Nancy paused for a moment. Well, yes. Could you wrap up the blue dress? I think I would like to buy it, she said, but thought, 
Maybe I'll wear it if I have to return to Georgia. Of course. Chapter 16 Attorney Jarrett Crown nodded and eyed Ethan. The attorney sat behind his shining walnut desk, elbows on the table and his fingers clasped together. I can certainly do that if you want, Ethan. It will be relatively easy. All you have to do is say the word. The word is said, Ethan told him, certain this was the right choice. He slid the paper, which he had jotted his thoughts on from the night before toward the attorney. I will get on it right now. It shouldn't take long. In fact, I could create it while you wait if you have time, the attorney said. Thank you. That will be great. I'm waiting for Savannah to pick out a dress. Ethan said, grinning as he thought of her winning the money in the poker game. Crown reached into his jacket and pulled out a cigar, then held it out to Ethan. Actually, you should be offering me one of these. Shouldn't you have something to celebrate real soon? When's the big day? You're getting ahead of yourself, Jarrett. Savannah and I are still getting to know one another. You wouldn't want to marry a stranger, either, would you? Ethan, you are not difficult to get to know. You say what you mean and mean what you say. You incorporate the values Reverend Harold preaches every Sunday. You may have flaws, Ethan. All of us do. But there is no deception in you and no guile, Jarrett pointed out. Thank you, Jarrett. That's a nice compliment. Jarrett stuck the cigar in his mouth. A match was pulled from his desk drawer and flicked on his thumbnail. Once the flame touched the cigar, gray smoke surrounded him. There was one constant about Jarrett. He was never far away from his cigars. Ethan had never seen him run out of them either. From what I hear of the young lady, you've made a pretty good catch. Smoke wafted from the attorney's mouth with every word spoken. Are the tales about the poker game true? If so, I wish I had been there to see it. Ethan chuckled. If you've heard tales of gunfights and dead bodies, then no, the tales are not true. If you heard tales that Savannah drew two eights to complete a flush, then yes, it's true. Jarrett threw his head back and laughed. You've got yourself an amazing woman, Ethan. She hasn't been here that long, and she's already working on becoming a legend. I'm sure folks will tell that story for years. Heard there was a professional gambler at the game. Is that true? Yes, a man named Brett Holiday. Ethan watched him start preparing the document he'd stopped by to have created. Word is he taught her to play on the journey over. That must have scorched him to be beaten by a woman, and one that he taught to boot. Jarrett glanced up from his work and arched a brow at his friend. No, Ethan shook his head. Actually, Mr. Holliday took it rather well. He was even smiling and gave us a quote from his papa. Crown chuckled as he took another puff from his cigar. It must have been an interesting evening. Something to tell the grandchildren about. You two should donate some of the money you won to Reverend Terrell. You were either extraordinarily lucky or there was divine intervention on your side. Just in case it was the latter, you ought to drop a little something in the collection plate this Sunday. We may drop more than a little. Just in case, as you said. Ethan leaned forward, impatient to have this done. You're going to talk to the reverend before the wedding? He paused to look up and wait for the answer. We may ask for a little advice. He thought for a moment before finishing his comment. Wedding, it's a big step. It changes your life forever. It sure does. You look a bit perplexed, Ethan. Not having second thoughts, are you? I'm having thoughts, Jarrett. You've been a friend of mine for a long time. You think I'd make a good husband? I don't see why not. You're a good man, Ethan. I'm sure you'd make a better husband than most of the men in town. I don't see why you should be worried. Every groom gets a little shaky when thinking about the wedding day, but it passes. 
I'm not a man known for being edgy, but my hands shook a bit when the day came to marry Becky. I guess. I guess I knew it would be a change, a big change. And frankly, I have been arrogant at times, and still can be. But as my wedding day approached, I wondered if I would be a good husband, and if I was good enough for her. I changed some, so did she. But I look back on that day with fondness. But I've been alone for a while. I mean, I've worked at being alone, said. I had the ranch to build. I'm not too good with small talk. I run out of words quickly. Do all women like talking? Most do, Jared admitted. I'm just no good at it, even talking about things like the weather. They can compare today with yesterday or last week, things like that. If I walked out and there was snow, that was fine. If I walked out and the sun was shining, that was fine. If someone asked me if the sun was shining, I'd say, yep, and walk on. What more is there to say? He was growing irritable just thinking about it. I'm sure Savannah can prod you from time to time on topics of conversations. Wives will do that. Jarrett put his quill to paper again. I'm still not sure about making big decisions like this, though. Slow and steady, that's how my life should be. That's how I built up the ranch. Slow, steady, bit by bit. That's how I live my life. I certainly don't like change. But... You put in the ad for a mail-order bride, Ethan, Jarrett reminded him. Don't go talking yourself out of the notion. Ethan nodded. At the prodding of Alice, you know Alice can be persuasive. Crown nodded. She can be persuasive in a very feminine way. She can also be very persuasive in a very assertive way, covered in a layer of sweetness. She can get you turned around and get you thinking along the same way she is thinking, and when you're done, you're not sure what just happened. I admit, I've had questions about that mail-order bride letter ever since I took it to the post office. This is a big step, and frankly, Savannah has some traits that are similar to my sister. She is not a wallflower. She will never wilt which is just the type of wife you need in the West. This land is not for wallflowers. It's not for weak men and not for weak women either. And I think you know that, Ethan. He nodded. Yes, yes, that's true. You're just getting cold feet, Ethan. It happens. Ignore it. But this is a big decision. What if it's a mistake? It won't be a mistake, Ethan because you and Savannah will make it work. If there's one thing you are used to, it's hard work. You built up that ranch. You faced all the challenges, and there were a lot of them. And you won, and you will work hard at the marriage. He signed and handed the document over, then watched Ethan sign it. Sure, marriage is a different type of work, a type you've never experienced before, no man has until he puts the ring on his bride. But you've built a farm, and you have the needed qualities to build a good marriage. Like the farm, it will take some work, but you can do it. And from what I hear about Savannah, she has the qualities to build a good marriage, too. Ethan stood up and started toward the door. Thanks for listening, Jarrett. You're a good friend. He and Jarrett both knew that he'd already made his mind up. Yet, he'd never stop being cautious. And, if he stayed in Jared's office, he might talk himself right out of the biggest decision of his life. He walked down to the general store where Savannah was waiting outside. Ready to go, he said. Savannah nodded. He noticed the package in her hand. Got a dress, he said. Yes, I think it's a nice one. Her mood seemed to have dimmed from earlier when they'd rode into town. He helped her into the buckboard, then climbed up on the seat. Is there any place else you would like to go? No, not right now, Savannah said in a low, almost absent-minded voice. Is she having second thoughts, too? 
He flicked the reins and headed the horses toward the ranch house. A lonely red-tailed hawk flew above the buckboard as it rolled toward its destination. Several riders traveling to Easter Springs waved as they passed. The deep Colorado blue painted the sky with only an occasionally white cloud. A breeze blew from the mountains. Although Ethan noticed all this, he couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I'd like to see your new dress, he said. Okay, I'll wear it soon, Savannah said. He looked over at her. Are you all right? You're usually more talkative. Well, sometimes I'm quiet. At a loss for what to say to that, Ethan shrugged. He figured if Savannah wanted to tell him anything, she would sooner or later. Now didn't seem a good time to reveal his decision to her, though. He focused on their future. He thought perhaps they should ask Reverend Terrell for a session together. The pastor had consulted with many newlyweds and could provide some wisdom to them. The longer he thought about it, Ethan felt uneasy, and he didn't like feeling uneasy. Like his work, he was steady and solid. Nervousness was a trait other men had, but not him. He didn't think there would be this many questions. But this decision not only involved him, it involved Savannah, a lady he had asked to come to Colorado. He bore some responsibility for her. The question of whether he would be a good husband weighed down on him. To be honest, he had never thought about the question much. Why should he? He was too busy building the ranch and running cattle. Before, his decisions about the ranch only involved himself and his immediate family. If he made a mistake, then he paid the price, not them. He made sure that he would suffer the consequences if he was wrong. But now another person, an extension of him, was involved. And she was a good woman. He did not want to hurt her. Ethan... Savannah slapped his shoulder. We're here. He pulled on the reins to slow the horses. He had almost rolled the buckboard past the horse. I'll let you off. Go unhitch this, and then I need to get out to the south pasture. He was thinking that hard work would help settle his nerves. She nodded. Think I'm going to ride a bit before I begin the work day. Fine. It didn't take him long to unhitch the horses and saddle his mount. As he rode toward the south pasture, he saw Savannah walking to the barn. He waved and she waved back. Chapter 17 Savannah quickly saddled her horse, mounted him and spurred him down the trail. She headed for what she now called the Valley of the Aspens a curve where two lines of aspens guarded the trail, then curved toward a brook. She spurred courage, and he broke into a gallop. The wind roared through her hair as she galloped toward the valley. Courage's hooves pounded on the ground as he turned right toward the destination. The horse's hooves dug into the soft earth, spitting it up and tossing it back, and echoing the sound across the valley. A red-tailed hawk, as if a guardian in the air, swept along the same route as courage. Horse and hawk gliding along earth and sky. It took five minutes for the swift horse to make it to the valley. Savannah slowed him to a trot toward the brook. She wanted a place to think. The scenic green valley surrounding the aspens with their yellow leaves was perfect. Maybe she should have just confronted Ethan before they had left town, but she was shocked by what Evelyn had said and had needed time to think. Courage bent his head down to drink from the flowing waters. She patted him and sighed. If only she could read men like she could read horses, life would be so much easier. You know, boy, I like Ethan, but sometimes you can't judge a man immediately. Men can fool you. All people can act one way around you, but be completely different when they're not. She had learned that hard lesson in Georgia. They can lie and cheat, but do it with a smile. They can deceive you. 
But the wonderful thing about nature is that it can't deceive you. Whether it is scenic or spectacular or ugly, the weather and higher powers decide if it changes one day to the next. If it's beautiful one day, it's usually beautiful the next day. Another sigh escaped her. Not like men. Sometimes men can change on you. And women can change on men, I guess. She patted courage again. Not that I think Ethan would change. To be honest, he seems about as stable as the weather. That's the problem, though. He seems stable today and will probably be just as stable 10 years from now. But can I really be sure? She shook her head, looking down at Courage as if he understood her. Since we've only known each other for a short time, I have to consider Evelyn's accusations. I don't even know her, yet my heart barely knows Ethan. My heart, yes, my heart is involved. That realization somehow gave her strength. She needed to fight through this. I'd like to think I can handle almost anything, but what she said shook me, shook me to the core. Now that I'm out here, I feel better. She bent over on the mount, leaning on the saddle horn. If I stay here, Courage, we're going to be out here a lot in this very spot, and I'll be talking to you a lot. I find it very relaxing, and you do what your name claims. You give me courage. You don't have to answer back, though. It would be nice if you could talk. I'd love to get a second opinion about things. Courage walked slowly into the brook, letting the water flow over his hooves. Okay, I feel better, Savannah said more a realization that needed the weight of sound. I need to find Ethan and talk to him. She looked around. If what she said is true, if Ethan would do that, then I'll try not to miss him, but I will miss this place. She grabbed the reins, knowing she'd missed them both, and pulled Courage's head up. Then she spurred him from the brook. Several minutes later, she spied Ethan. Savannah guessed he was riding back from the south pasture and was heading toward the house. She waved at him. At first, he didn't see her. Then he turned his head and saw her second wave. He waved back and turned his horse to gallop toward her. Savannah tensed as she rode toward Ethan. She didn't think she believed Evelyn, but... Shadows of doubt filled her mind. Ethan, smiling, halted his horse as he rode up. He opened his mouth to say hello, but she spoke first. Ethan, I need to talk to you. The edge in her voice was as sharp as a slap. What is it? Do you want to go to the house? His eyes narrowed as he studied her face. No, let's talk here. She dismounted thinking the firm ground would steady her. He followed her lead and climbed off Daisy. She kept her eyes on his face, needing to see as well as hear his response. What is it? he asked again. When I was in the general store, she said, forcing a calm back into her tone, a lady named Evelyn Nodding came up to me. No, Savannah, let me finish. Her sharp edge was back. She said hello and that I must be the new mail-order bride in town. I told her that I was. She said you had romanced her and other ladies in the town. He appeared ready to interrupt her, but she rushed on. But that you always pulled back at the last moment. She told me that you would even say you wanted to marry them, but then you would leave. Savannah's voice lowered to almost a whisper. She said you did that to her. Ethan started shaking his head, but she continued. She also said that's why you had to send for a mail-order bride. You have basically romanced and left most of the women in town, so you had to look other places for a bride. No, no, absolutely no, Ethan said, anger sparking in his eyes. Evelyn lied to you, Savannah. That's one of the reasons I avoided dating her. 
He raked a hand through his hair while his jaw muscle nodded. Then he grounded out. She was and is a liar. She spread rumors around town. That woman made me so cautious and suspicious of trusting anyone. His suspicious looks, Savannah thought, and could tell he was being truthful. I did not romance her, Ethan went on to say in a rush, like water flowing in the brook. Believe me, I didn't want to be within gun range of that woman. She got mad because I kept telling her no. But I assure you that I never gave her any indication that I wanted to date, much less marry her, and she's still mad. I see, Savannah said softly, regretting her own anger in the face of his. You know, I didn't really think she was your type. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a piece of paper. I can prove it, too. No, you don't have to. She hoped the woman hadn't damaged their fragile trust in each other. To make things right, she told him, I believe you, Ethan. He held the paper out to her. I should have done this earlier, but I don't like change. No more words were needed on that note. She took the paper and unfolded it. As she read it, her eyes widened. Ethan. Yes, that's my will, Savannah. He stepped closer to her. I had a lawyer make it up today. If I die, everything I have goes to you as my wife. You will own the bar, W. I've been a stable, hard-working man all my life, Savannah. I've taken few chances. I don't like change. Unlike you, even my poker bets are small. She smiled, remembering the men saying he was bad at poker. But there are times when I need to take a big chance. Alice was right about that. My happiness depends on it. I've never been a man of many words. But around you, it's like my tongue has had too much whiskey. He took her hand in his and her eyes widened. You know this ranch means everything to me. The time for me to make a big decision hit me after Sunday's sermon. But after watching you play poker, I knew a good many things. I know that I've grown to love you, Savannah. Tears flooded her eyes. He looked a little uncomfortable, but continued anyway. We'll make a good marriage, so will you marry me, Savannah? Yes, Ethan, I'll marry you. One step closed the distance between them, and she raised up on her toes to kiss him. And I love you, too. He hugged her so hard, she struggled to breathe. His grip lessened, and he kissed her again. Since we already have the horses with us, why don't we ride in and see if Reverend Harrell has any advice for the newest couple in town? We'll make it official and then we'll go pick you out the prettiest ring in Colorado. And set the wedding date, she whispered. He answered her with another kiss. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.